I'm here to have a good discussion. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, yeah. The um, uh, the dead squirrels over there are a little bit much, I think. And um, it's kind of right over there. And then the the missionaries trapped in the basement. Oh, I think they're making a little bit of noise. That. But after you know, oh, I think man. they'll get the point if we if we stomp our feet a little bit. Is this thing high enough, or am I? It might fall. If I feel like it's it's falling. Oh yeah, it's falling off the table here. Do you see that? Yeah. Just do your best. <laughs> okay. I'm it's just... a live stream. Okay. As you long can as they can it, hear me. You, see, you can lean it on that. You're fine. You're okay. fine. Okay. If they can hear me, then it's, we're good. Yeah. All right. So the first thing that I wanted to say was thank you. Honestly, I want to make sure that people feel comfortable and safe from all different kind of opinions who come in here. And whether it's, you know, my program or anywhere else in the sphere, I think it's important to be uh, constructive and actually get to the heart of what people's concerns are and actually what your opinions are. And, uh, you know, I, I take people's faith crises and things like that seriously. And so um, I want to make sure that not just that you feel comfortable and that we can have a good discussion and it's not just going to be totally yeah. at each other's throat or something. Um, I hope that the comment section also uh, engages with our, our arguments and uh, as respectful as they can be. It's my, my hope. First it's the internet starting off. Um, yeah. I don't believe that. I believe my internet comment section will be as delightful as possible. Right, guys? So uh, you guys can absolutely put in your super chats. If you have a certain question that you want to add to this discussion, I'll throw it up on screen. Um, I have a couple moderators. So guys, be nice. So don't have to kick anybody out as well. And we're going to go through a bunch of different topics and talk to Kwaku about, you know, your beliefs and how they relate to just the changing aspects of Mormonism today. And uh, just to introduce things, I mean, people know you from what, Word Radio? They know you from yes. Jubilee Appearance. Yeah. They yeah. know you from different like apologetics things. The This is the show. Tits, yes. The yes. Things. What else am I missing? Uh, um. Uh, this one random Studio C sketch. Really? Yeah. I played a pirate. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, <laughs> the Saints Unscripted, right? Yeah. Saints Unscripted was the, the the first one. And then after that, it was This Is The Show, which, by the way, I just want to put this on record, was oh. initially called Saints Unleashed. There was a squabble with Saints Unscripted because both used the word saints. So we had to refilm it and we came up with this is the show, like this is the place, you know, but we just didn't, our minds weren't going to tits mm -hmm. because. But it is kind of the funny way of doing it's it. It's really right? funny. It's the funniest I'm way I'm happy of it happened. It. <laughs> I think it's absolutely funny. Technically it's tis because you don't pronounce the the or the and like in a, but yeah, no, within five minutes we realized this is, this is tits. But you know what? I, I I thought it was hilarious. I'm happy it played out that way. If I ever get lucky enough to re they make a movie about my life, then there gets to be the segment where I was in a, a called program tits. called Tits. Yeah. yeah. And I got paid for it. I got paid to be in Tits. I mean, there's mm -hmm. usually people who get paid to do stuff with mm -hmm. Tits or on websites that are blocked in certain states. So Well, someone can make the argument that, yeah, too much Tits, it got taken down or, you know, whatever you want to say. That is true. That is true. <laughs> it had too much tit. All right. If you guys we're don't like know what we're talking about. Boys right here. We're like laughing. So <laughs> I know, but this is the this is the niche of the the, the X yeah. world. And before we started Quake, I told Quake who I was like, we'll start kind of general and broad, and we're yeah. going into like the hilariousness of something that happened, I don't know, five years ago. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so people know you from generally uh your, I would say like apologetic kind of takes um around explaining Mormon doctrine or culture or news events, things like that from Ward Radio and yeah, your appearance on Jubilee. And uh, we come from two different operating spheres of me and trying to give more reasons of why I think the church isn't true. And maybe you on the other side saying these are the reasons the church is true or true for me or where I find validation and spirituality and doing that through your different platforms. So um, for people who don't know you, I kind of wanted just to start with, uh, you know, your basic overview that you were a convert to the church, didn't grow up in the church, and just wanted to ask you about what yeah, attracted you to the church um, what, yeah, what the missionary lessons were like and kind of how old you were and what your, your transition was into like, you know, moving to Utah and getting involved in all this space. Yeah. So grew up, um, youngest of six in Cypress, Texas. And, um, you know, then, uh, went to San Francisco 
and then from San Francisco, uh, decided to come to school in Utah to BYU. Um, my conversion story isn't isn't too like insane, you know. Um, North Houston has a lot of members of the church it's right next to the Houston Temple, and it's kind of like a little, you know, like Gilbert in era and Mesa, Arizona, like little Mormon pockets. There's like it's like a little mini Mormon pocket right up there. Um, so, you know, I had a lot of friends who were members, and you know just kind of joined um, as a teenager. And then, um, you know, I, I liked, I liked the book of Mormon. I liked the story of Joseph Smith. I liked, um, you know, the idea of, I liked that Mormonism had exhaustively, I won't say exhaustively, but compared to the Christian denominations that are prevalent in Texas Southern Baptist, you know, um, uh, United Methodist, Evangelical Christianity. I like that Mormonism had a an, an afterlife explanation that was more than just it's going to be fun, right? There's a little more like painted. There's different kingdoms of heaven, right? There's there's the idea of of glory. Uh, there's deification. I thought that was cool because generally uh, a lot of people of faith don't go into any explanation of what the next life is like. And I thought it was really interesting that it was like Christianity with more detail. Um, and yeah, and so, I mean, I had friends in it and I liked it. And there are concepts that my family was already down with. And so, boom, there it is. And then it happened. And then you went to BYU. And yeah. what was your experience like at BYU <laughs> then? Jeez. Because as we're going to get into the whole one of, one of the, to me, you know, spurring reasons of this discussion was a tweet that you put out a couple of weeks ago, how you were explaining that you felt really misunderstood and misrepresented that uh, people like John and me think that you are too liberal or sorry, too conservative. And you're like, I could be more liberal than well, John and Kara put together. And yeah. Being, I, I, you know, in the Democrat society of BYU. Yeah. And things, I, so. I was, I was president of BYU Dems and, um, you know, I don't. People think, um, okay, I get it. Because of Ward Radio has a, a decidedly right wing flair, we could say that. Okay, um, you know, Cardin is a definitely more right wing than left. I don't think it's controversial to say that. Um, he is an Andrew Yang guy. He's a UBI guy, but generally speaking, socially, he's more conservative. Um, but if you watch that show, on nearly all of the topics that are political, I'm disagreeing with everyone. I don't think people watch it. They just see us three and they go, oh, Kwaku's a, a Republican. But I'm really not. Like, I don't, if you like, you know, listen to what I, I, I say, we've argued on there about just about every kind of, you know, uh, uh, whether it's Israel, Palestine. Um, it was pretty clear I disagreed with them. Um, on even just the recent one in the Black Menaces, you know, um, I, I disagreed and said, I don't think that there's, you know, Marxist. And then we debated on what Marxist actually meant. We're constantly debating on the term woke because the term woke comes up in the show a lot. And I think the term woke was an effective tool to use like six or seven years ago to describe people who were creating online personas based off of leftism that didn't actually care for a progressive cause mm -hmm. um, and didn't really understand it. And woke was a great way to, to kind of show, hey, these people are not really these people aren't concerned with for-profit prisons. These people aren't concerned with the military industrial complex. These people aren't concerned with, with homelessness, with, with, with the fact that our public schools are determined by property taxes. They're not concerned with that. They're concerned about three different issues. Those are wokes. But now it's being used for anybody who is left of Ben Shapiro is being called woke. So yeah. on, on word radio, we, we debate those topics a lot. So, you know, when John goes and says, "Oh, Quake, who's a right winger?" I'm like, "Where? How? How am I a a right winger? I don't I don't really see it." Mm -hmm. um, so that's really that. Like like, if generally speaking, I'd be considered pretty liberal, and sometimes and a, a left wing anarchist on some subjects, like pretty out there, mm -hmm. you know. So that's all right. That's all right, you know. So let me ask then. With what I view as Word Radio's main audience, and you could say like 
the Seawick channel and Jacob Hansen. And so much of, to me, a lot of the discourse is uh, not necessarily going after the issues that people maybe in faith crisis or whatever are talking about. Sometimes it's just more like, I think, a dog whistle or something that people are putting out, uh, whether it's, you know, making fun of John DeLynn or saying people are woke or attacking the, like, faltering morals of society, going after those kinds of things that so many also, like, you know, right-wing talk show hosts go after of, like, look at this moral decay, these things like this. People, I played a clip in my Jubilee response uh, to you guys where uh, maybe it was a while ago, but you were talking about, you know, the ways that these different like life coaches or people like John DeLynn or whoever that they sometimes I guess in your opinion at least then are uh very morally loose in and are creating like this downfall of society do you know where I'm going with this that uh people are out there effing on yachts if you know that quote that I played in the Jubilee video that there's uh people like John or me or anyone else who's it's it's not the ideas of of the ex Mormons sometimes that I find these people debating. It's that we're so loose in our structure that 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 I think leads to a, a lot of conservative dog whistles, in my opinion, where people are like, yeah, yeah, those people are just immoral and they're loose and they're gross, and uh, I think that plays up in a in the Ward Radio audience in the discourse on that side. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, it doesn't help that there's personal beef, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I mean, at Jubilee, John and I shook hands. We had a good conversation. I had a conversation with Margie. Um, it's also Margie, by the way. It's Margie. Nobody has ever corrected you on that? No, I thought it was Margie. No. It's Margie. Yeah, it's Margie. Okay, but... well, you know, I think, look, as a guy named Kwaku, I have we a free pass to right. mispronounce names. It's my whole life, you know. They used to put oatmeal boxes on my desk in school. Hmm. The Quaker Oats. Mm -hmm. They would bring empty oatmeal boxes because it was Quaker, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, well, there's no there's personal beef there. And, you know, but if you look at some of the other people who are critical of Mormonism at large, like um, Joe, <laughs> um, the people that I think we've, sparred with have also sparred back so it's it was kind of like like bill real you know bill real and me are not best friends but he can take a punch i can take a punch so it's fine but even people like rfm i kind of have a good relationship with rfm now you know um but i don't know i don't i don't think that if you're ex-mormon that means you don't have morals or you're you're you know you're a you're uh you've thrown morality out the window and you're just, you're all focused on the thrills. I don't think that's how most people are. You know, mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I mean, be, being ex Mormon doesn't mean you're part of a cohesive movement, but I do right. think in the past 10 years, there's a reason why in Utah people, when people hear ex Mormon, they do think of a type of person. They do think of an archetype of a person because I do think ex Mormon media has branded itself well as a certain, like, angle right ex-mormon generally when someone says i'm an ex-mormon you're not thinking of like the temple square protesters like the, the the christian evangelicals you think of a more left more secular person in the media who talks about mormonism critically to an audience that's what you think of and so um you know and 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 maybe there's Because, because generally speaking, the biggest figureheads of ex Mormon media are liberal. Then, when you have guys like Thoughtful Faith, which was Jacob Hansen, and Quick Media, and and the clash is obviously there because they're on the right and you're on the left, and that only makes the divide even greater. Because you can say, first, look at these Mormon apologists; they're conservative, they're they're or they're or alt-right is even the term that gets thrown around and this is how they view women this is how they view women's autonomy this is how they view uh, minority rights i mean is this really the kind of religion you want to be a part of and they can say oh look at these ex-mormons they're all pro-abortion and they hate the family and they hate men they're like every, every because of the political divide you get to put everybody in the stereotype of what their political camp already is 
to help the argument, right? Mm -hmm. It has a lot of ad hominem to it that I just don't really care for. Because like I said at the beginning, I think these things are honestly really serious. We're talking about people's faith and it's a disservice to the conversation to, to do ad hominem things. And so, yeah, on that same theme, there's at least one or two videos um, that maybe Jacob Hansen put out about like by their fruits, you shall know them. And it's like a really disingenuous master cut of things that I have said or Zelf or John or, uh, you know, Exmo Lex or whatever, and taking things very much out of context and just linking things together. Like, look how nihilistic they are. And look how they're talking about polyamory and they're talking about uh, just, you know, all atheism or whatever. And it's like, you put it all together in 30 minutes. And I, in preparation for this interview, I wanted to kind of get a wide swath of, of, you know, a lot of your audience that still, you know, listens to you and respects you. And so I did go into the Ward Radio Discord for about 10 minutes until I was kicked out. I didn't do anything. I went under incognito, which I thought was hilarious. And I that's, like, you funny. gotta, you gotta be, look, I would have known that's you Thank immediately you. if I saw that. <laughs> I've been in that too. Cause I think there's something else we can agree on. And, uh, and yeah, I was reading different things and, and I typed in my name just to see what people in the board radio audience had to say about me. And a lot of things that came out of that video, like that Jacob Hansen did, it's like, I can never listen to Kara ever again because she said something that was really nihilistic that was taken completely out of context or whatever. And I'm like, this is, this is only feeding into oh. a, a divide that really doesn't well, need to I, happen. I get those comments on the ward radio page too. Um, I got, to, I, so I, I got called up. Whenever we did our new age videos where I would like quick explain the new age. So I did a thing on the a course in miracles. Um, and we even did a multiple mortal probations episode and stuff like that. I got wrecked in the comments and they're like, I'm now I'm skipping any episode with Quaku because, you know, I, I'm not exactly in line with with their their tunnel vision of, of, of mm -hmm. what spirituality should be. So, you yeah, know, I get I get go go look at um, any any of the past 30 episodes, the ones that I'm like headlining. Like half the comments are like anti me. Mm -hmm. So eh, it's just the internet. It's the wild, mm -hmm. wild west. Um, but, but I think I mean, that's awesome that you are, you, in one respect, I, I do think so much of word radio generally uh, is going to keep continuing in a sort of, uh, yeah, ministering to the people who want to kind of hate on ex-Mormons. Uh, and hate on you know liberals and things uh, i do think that that's a lot of the discourse of what at least when i was a, a very mormon conservative that's what i wanted you know it's not necessarily talk about the problems that and address the issues sometimes it's just i want to hear uh, my talking points repeated to me in this echo chamber but i do think that's awesome um i do agree i've watched a lot of the videos and i have seen a lot of those comments where your own audience is not on board yeah well okay well and, and to be fair it isn't my channel, right? He's like, like I'm I would call you a co-host of it, right? Like more recurring, but I'm not. It's not my channel at all. Like, um, like Cardin funded it. Cardin built it. It's like it's in his studio. Like that's it's it's his it's his show. Um, but you know, I I like them all as guys. Like I spent a lot of time with them. Like we have a, you know, they really are good guys. But you know, the, but also I think you have to see kind of where they're coming from, you know, um, and. I do feel like the Mormon apologetics community gets hit with the ad hominem attack, but I think it's pretty clearly from both sides, right? Like there is this thread on Reddit where Mike Norton was trying to tell people my name was actually Gary. Yeah. If you want to shit on Mike Norton, you it's are like, in good company with me right now. Yeah. So. A lot of people don't like him, but you know, he, he, people did like him before when he was doing all sorts of just insane stuff that, I mean, going way past that hominem, the guy was just, it was wild. Yeah. You know? I also just want to add a disclaimer, though, because so many people, especially since COVID, are, are are leaving the church and going through newly faith crisis. And like I left in 2019, 2020, and most people, I say, you know, they're in different stages and they don't know what happened with Mike Norton, like, I don't know, eight years ago, because they only started paying attention to the space when their kind of faith crisis started. So like, I think to be fair, people enter this at different stages and they just have no idea that's that, that yeah that, that, that totally could be fair yeah but at least from from the mormon apologetic perspective there was a long period where you know i mean even someone like dan peterson just an old professor who just kind of minds business on campus like the stuff i've seen people say about him is pretty cruel you know so i i think it's obviously it's both sides that throw muck at each other um but i mean like I mean, I, I, 
I've seen na- nasty, nasty things from obviously both sides say nasty stuff, but like I've been called. I don't think there's one Reddit thread about me where someone doesn't have a theory that I like I'm a secretly gay with a boyfriend. It's like yeah. I've I literally like if I was gay, I would just be honest. Like, I don't ask my exes. I don't know what you want me to say. It's yeah. pretty clear. And on that subject, I don't and, know if you know this, that I put out a video about two weeks ago about uh, why I'm leaving for the summer and yeah, yeah. I work at a summer camp. And one of the things in one of my explanations uh, talking about preparation for you coming and doing this interview was about Mike Norton. And I have this whole story that I can tell you another time. I don't yeah, know. People yeah. have already seen it um, about a lot of ex Mormons, actually content creators. Um, Cause I think, again, we have to di- differentiate between just people who are like random commentators. And I think the general attitude of most content creators that are ex Mormons and like what we want to stand for. And there was a group chat at the, like back in 2020, 2021, where it's probably 20, 30, Next Mormon TikTokers, and then Mike Norton's over there, and he's saying a bunch of stuff about you, about you being gay or making fun uh, yeah. of your name. And it was all ex Mormons <laughs> who stood up to Mike Norton, saying like, "That's not cool. Don't talk like that." That's and we and it was a big divide where people didn't really know how um, uh, off kilter the guy can be sometimes. And so I think it's important one to differentiate between like I as an ex Mormon content creator, it's like I can hear what you just said and I can unequivocally like say, "Please don't do that." Like you know. Quaco spells his name K W U K W A K A U. I can't spell on the top of my head. It's a hard. You know, it's like I spell my name with an H at the end. We're all confusing. But I think, like, uh, hopefully, people in the ex-Mormon space, um, they can they can see the arguments of yours that they 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 don't like and not go to ad hominems and stuff. And I I want to be able to unequivocally say that as an ex-Mormon space, I I don't want to do that. I want to leave that kind of that kind of crap. Well, I I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I that would be that. That's ideal. But yeah, no, I mean, I, I recognize I may be slightly jaded because look, we probably both have read thousands and thousands of comments about us online, just nitpicking everything about us as people. Right. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, the strong survive. And if your arguments hold weight, then they'll carry on, you know, regardless if people are like, oh, well, you know, I think his. I think he's, he's, I think, I think quick he's fruity. It's like, well, cause he watched it in some script. It was a teenage theater kid. Like, <laughs> yeah, of course you think that. Like you bulked up. I, yeah. I, I grew up a little, <laughs> um, but yeah, but, um, you know, I, I think that's a long way to say I'm not that right wing. I think that's okay. the answer to the question. I'm really not. I mm-hmm. consider myself more left. Like I was rooting for Marianne Williamson. I mean, that's mm-hmm. my pick. I my would turn. love for Marianne Williamson we to be president. Um, I really liked RFK until recently. I mean, he's still, I think, a good idea. He's, I think, he's a good pick, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of how pro Zionism he is. And then, um, like, obviously, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I have to jo- vote for Joe Biden. It's like, okay, okay, he's done better than I think people thought he was going to do. I don't agree that he's. He can't speak. I mean, you go watch the State of the Union. He did a great job. He did a phenomenal job. Uh, so, yeah, I'm voting. I'm voting Democrat. I'm voting left. Um, I got actually, if you go find some of the Desnat accounts on Twitter, one of the biggest things that happened last year was someone clipped me in a in, a, in this debate where I said, um, it's definitely possible um, that like a f- that that marriage as we understand it is not going to be the same in the next life and that it's definitely possible um for gay people to have marriage in the next life and people clipped that desnes clipped it and said look at quake who's such an apostate and but then the same people are saying oh well, quake pushes you know homophobic stuff i'm like well, literally if these guys are saying i'm 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 bad because I'm pro-gay and these guys are saying I'm bad because I'm anti-gay. It's like, well, clearly no one wants to hear what I actually have to say. They're just like throwing the stuff back and forth. So I do think people get an idea of who someone is and then they, um, uh, they attack, they attack the fake idea as opposed to like the real nitty gritty or, or a past idea of like, you know, 
you in 2010 are not you now. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And I also think for some reason in like religious dialogue, the idea of, of evolving or changing is looked down upon, which is crazy to me because I don't trust anybody that's kept the same opinion their whole life. Like that, that no, no rational person should keep one opinion forever. Like you should probably change the way you view the world because the world's changing. And if your opinions aren't changing with it, then you're just kind of a, an ASS. I don't really know what, what words I can say here on the, I don't want to get, I don't want to get you kicked off. Yeah. No, I see what you mean. Um, and let's continue to kind of go down that idea of what you actually believe. Cause I, I, my biggest frustration, even when I was very Mormon, very conservative, um, people have no idea how conservative I was. Um, but before I left the church in 2019 and something that irritated me then, and now is when people engage with ideas about a group and it's like a monolith that they are attacking. And it's like ex Mormons act like this, generally speaking, or they have these opinions and stuff and not actually be like, Hey, I'm right here. Like what's, tell tell me what you don't like about my opinions not this generality that you put out so i think that's a good introduction to go into um yeah what you actually do believe and i know it's going to be different than what other people who are mormon believe so if you wouldn't mind um first of all what in in mormonism what do you think to be called a a member of the church of jesus christ of latter day saints to uh, be in good standing, to say that you can pass a temple recommend interview. What do you think are like the core things that actually make somebody a member of the church? Because that can come in so many different shapes and sizes. And so if you were like a missionary and you're like, this is what the LDS church believes in. This is what it teaches. This is what it offers. This is what the proposition is. Um, kind of what would you say to that? Okay. Uh, that's where I'm going to get in some trouble. So, um, obviously it's, do you believe in the restored gospel, the tense of the restored gospel as taught by the LDS church? Do you believe the book of Mormon is true? Do you believe Joseph Smith was a prophet? Um, and do you believe Russell Nelson is a prophet? Do you abstain from alcohol, tea and coffee? Do you follow the law of chastity? And, you know, have you, are there any crimes or something you've committed? I think those are generally the, you know, the, the questions. And, um, but I have, this is my approach that gets me to some trouble, but I identify, I didn't really stop saying Mormon when the name switch happened. We noticed Midnight Mormons. Oh, we noticed. Yeah. Well, because I identify as Mormon before LDS, you know, mm. so, um, because there are a number of different denominations in the restoration and it's weird how someone can be protestant but they can be methodist they could be baptist they could be presbyterian there's a number of different ways you can be protestant but they're still protestant first before they're of those denominations i believe in the book of mormon but tomorrow if some if news broke that jeffrey r holland was like beating Yorkies in his basement or something and like just a massive scandal, just, just institutional collapsing. Like nobody could trust the brethren. The whole church office building is gone haywire and they're evil. 15 stake presidents get arrested for money. Just whatever. I could, I would still be Mormon because my belief in the book of Mormon is rooted outside of the LDS church. Um, the first vision happened before the church was established. The Book of Mormon was translated before the church was established. Even the priesthood restoration happened before the church was established. I don't know why we think being LDS has to contain everything Mormon. And if you stop being LDS, then the whole restoration is thrown out. There's a ton of different perspectives of, of Mormon history. There's a ton of different takes on what some of these concepts mean. And, and even Joseph Smith taught a lot of things that we don't really teach or express today. And, you know, uh, we were talking about this last night, how generally most people in the ex-Mormon media space really dislike Brigham Young. <laughs> they really dislike Brigham Young, but they believe Brigham Young's version of Mormon history. And even though they're ex-Mormon, they still give credence to his version of history without looking at other versions of Mormon history that may come from the Bickertonites, um, uh, the Strangites, 
even community of Christ, there are so many other ways to be Mormon. So I have to look at this exhaustively and say, okay, I am Mormon first. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but if something happens to the church, I'm still going to be Mormon. And I don't believe that you have to have a black and white, a Mormon must be X, Y, Z, or else he's not Mormon. That's just not how spirituality works. And trying to dictate and gerrymander people's soul that way, it's just an ego stroke, right? Like you can be Mormon and you can believe in space aliens. You can be Mormon and you can believe in multiple mortal probations. You can be Mormon and you can kind of not even believe in anything, but you just go to church and fulfill your calling. We There isn't one way to actually be Mormon. That's why the church doesn't own the copyrights to the word Mormon. So Mormon first, LDS second. Mm. So yeah, and, that, and that's what puts me in this interesting position where I'm sometimes on my own little island here because sometimes LDS people don't understand me and ex-LDS people don't understand me. And I'm like, I'm sitting here in limbo. I literally mm-hmm. don't know uh, who, who 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 vibes into here, and you know part of that's uh, I'm really into Christ consciousness and all that stuff, and that's I think the Book of Mormon is a huge, big Christ consciousness book. I think the Restoration is extremely um, esoteric and 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 has a lot of elements of non dualism. I think we have barely begun to understand what joseph smith was really putting out there i don't even think he fully understood the the full message of of what he was channeling and putting out into the world Mm -hmm. okay so many questions (laughs) popping off my head um yeah because that's where i kind of wanted to start in terms of people are going to be obviously like frustrated with you and confused with you where my brain goes to is so much of me, my audience, the way that we were raised in this type of more like McConkey Mormonism, Mormon doctrine, things coming down from the pulpit. These are the leaders um, that you respect and you adhere to their authority. Listen to the words yeah. I have verily set forth. Yeah, that's my, yeah, that's my and, McConkey. <laughs> um, and so by one account, it's like we were taught this very straightforward way to be in line with the spirit of God and the spirit will be taken from us. If we are not following the tenets uh, that are revealed by the first presidency, um, we can't be with our family together if we uh, divert from that path and all of those things. So that to most of us is what Mormonism is. It is not um, something that has a, a little bit more of uh, do you do your own path and you know, pe- most people would not ever describe themselves, I would guess, that are in the church in this in a similar way as you just did, or anyone who's left the church, that that was their experience with Mormonism. And so, for one, I can I can feel a lot of the frustration from the ex-Mormons listening right now um, who have been not given that kind of allowance, privilege, um, to be able to, to have a, such an expansive view of doctrine and ideas and adherence to prophets without feeling like their internal soul is going to be you know, up for Satan's taking. Um, so uh, I feel a lot of fr- ideas about frustration that on one account, you know, you can go on Jubilee, you can you can say Mormonism is is true in, 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 in kind of a way that feels maybe like moving the goalpost or speaking out of both sides of your mouth where uh, you're upholding these ideas about why Mormonism is good and it is true. But most people, what you just described, that's, that's not Mormonism to them. You know where I'm going with that? So... <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, it, it very well may not be, um, you know, like to be fair on, on Jubilee, I was just, I tried to describe some of this stuff, but it didn't, it didn't make it into the, it didn't make it into the cut. I, um, but I was also honest in my initial interviews on there as well. They said, Hey, we've seen, we've seen you around, you're Mormon. Um, and they actually specifically asked actually with Cardin in the room, they called me and they said, how do you feel about? Do you need? Do we need to say LDS or Mormon? I think Cardin said uh, LDS, and I said, "Well, I, I I would say identify as Mormon first and LDS second. So I was honest with it. They just, you know, I don't. I'm not the editor or the producer, but um, yeah. Well, just in the same way that like a guy born in Burley, Idaho, to an LDS family in 1971 was raised totally different in the, in the church than someone born in, you know, St. George in 2005, right? Both are different Mormon perspectives. But at some point, you just have to say, look, people are going to interpret spirituality different. And 
this idea that because someone interprets and talks about their spirituality differently in a, in a way that doesn't reflect how I was raised, it doesn't mean that person is disingenuous or wrong. It means that there's just different paths to walk in life. Um, it, I don't have to reflect anybody but me. And, you know, I don't know why, because someone wants to go and talk about their belief in the Book of Mormon, they now they have to, ref if their story doesn't reflect someone else's or doesn't reflect someone else's trauma. Well, I mean, good luck, you know, like good luck being a human. No one has the same story. It does. I may not represent, you know, uh, someone who has left the church and was taught, you know, oh, my, my eternal soul is at risk. My family can't be together forever. But whenever I, if I hear something like that, I have to ask, what does it mean that your family can be together forever? What does that even mean? Do, does the church even know what that means? Does the church even know what the celestial kingdom looks like? You know, we have these concepts which bring us further than a lot of mainstream Christianity. But then when you get there, you have to ask, what do these things actually mean? What actually is the priesthood? You know, um, is our priesthood blessings a form of manifestation? Is it literal magic? Is it some Enochian chant? Like, what is it? We don't actually know. And so I examine those things and I say, oh, well, I think that means we have to come to our own conclusions. We should talk about those conclusions. But just because my conclusions may be different than, you know, the conclusion that someone else feels like they were force fed. Well, that's just kind of life. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not really uh, a good like answer, you know. What it comes down to to me is I hear you kind of uh, removing the authority that the church's proposition puts forward. It's to me, the church's proposition it is the, the one true restored church that Joseph Smith was asking questions about what church he should join. God said all the rest of them are, are an abomination and you need to restore the one true church and restore these keys. And through these ordinances, these are the only, you know, practices and ordinances that will give you the information and the teachings that will, you know, seal your family back together and the right way to live to return to your heavenly father again and restoring that through Joseph Smith. That is the proposition in resistance to so much of the free will and fancy free other ideas that people put out. You know what I mean? Kind of. So sort of. So I would say um, when I read the writings of Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith seems a lot more liberal in his approach to spirituality and salvation than the prophets afterward. Joseph Smith made clear that the church and the kingdom of God were separate things. He has a whole sermon about how the church and the kingdom of God are not the same thing. And even look at the Book of Mormon. The end of the Book of Mormon, there's no church. The church is destroyed. Moroni, it's one guy carrying the record, and all he has is his divine connection to God. Mm -hmm. Well, let me stop you for a second. So how does that uh, converge then with the idea that you know, once God restored the church, that he will never, the way that prophets say that God will never let the church be led astray again. Um, well, Joseph Smith didn't say that. <laughs> Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball said that. Mm -hmm. I haven't found anywhere Joseph Smith just straight up said, I will never allow the church to, like, or God would never allow that to happen. He warned a lot about how the saints could fall. Doctrine and Covenants is full of Jesus saying, you're only my people if... And if you mess up, you're no longer my people. So that again, that's a tradition in LDS history, you know, to say that. Um, but, but I don't. But again, the the logic to me though is that Joseph Smith is saying, "I'm restoring this church. We're bringing back something from an apost uh, from the great apostasy. We're bringing back prophets, and that with these keys that are now going from me, Joseph Smith, into." the next hands of the next prophets, the next prophets to carry forth this dispensation until Christ comes again. That's more the proposition than I understand. And it sounds like you're saying that it's. Well, I'm saying he was restoring the gospel, but he also delineated that the kingdom of God and the church were not the same thing. And he often spoke about how the church could be destroyed. So we have, we have this man, the narrative of Mormonism from the manuals. And then we react to the manuals and assume that the teachings of the manuals or the, the correlated curriculum is exactly what Joseph Smith had in mind. But that, that can't be so. There's no way an institution that's deliberating on information and printing it out for a way that's 
easy for everyone to stomach is going to exhaustively reflect the mind of a 19th century mystic who we're still trying to figure out to this day, you know? So, yeah, I mean, the church, uh, you know, uh, that that flavor of Mormon history, you know, it it you can debate it. You can debate it. But if you still come at the end of, I think the Book of Mormon is real. I think this happened. I think there is wisdom and deep philosophy in this. I think it's something that can change your spirit and change society as a whole. I think this is is something that should be honored as a religious text along with, you know, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, along with the Old Testament, along with the New Testament, along with the Zendavesta. It's something for the soul. Then you know, I think that's totally fine. But I don't believe that um, Joseph Smith at all was 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 making himself out to be like the number one guy. He had too much self deprecation. He all 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 the time spoke about how you know he fell very short, and even the scriptures he he, he revelated from the Lord could, could chastised him a lot. So. Is the narrative Joe Smith came and said the church will never fall away, or is that something that kind of came from folksy talk after Joseph died? That's the real question for me because a lot of the things we attribute to Joseph saying, when I go and look, I haven't, I don't find him saying those things. You know, you find Brigham Young saying a lot, you find Heber C. Kimball, John Taylor, these guys saying a lot, but I'm talking OG Joseph Smith, you know. Um, and when I look at what Joseph taught. You do find a lot of room. I mean, he said, I've never heard of a man for um, being damned for believing too much just for believing too little. You know, he 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 talked about how God was extremely liberal when it comes to salvation. You know, um, um, he even if you look at his account with the Delaware tribe, with the Native Americans, and they're talking about the great spirit. Um, he honored what they believed, just like just like what's written in the Book of Mormon. And just like what Paul does in the New Testament, he says, look, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the great spirit, but he tells the Delaware tribe, the great spirit is true. So you find a lot in his life that allows there to be a perspective of more expansive spirituality. I mean, ultimately, you know, we believe that everyone can be saved and we believe that Jesus is, I mean, we're all the children of Heavenly Father. I mean, that, that's a pretty hardcore thing to say in the 19th century, and most people don't agree with that. So, yeah, I, 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 I differ from a lot of people there because I don't necessarily think that just because the in, an institution says jump, we have to say how high, or I don't want to jump that high when there's a completely different way we can examine it. And I think as, as human beings, we owe that to ourselves. You know, we're allowed to read the Book of Mormon with our own spiritual lens and say, what is this actually saying? Are some of these lessons different than what, you know, um, my neighbors and my bishop think? And that's up to you to decide to be brave enough to tackle that on and accept a message or expand upon a message that maybe other people aren't getting. Um, if you don't want to do that, that's totally fine. But it doesn't mean that everybody has to be just, you know, follow the manual, follow the manual. Mm -hmm. So to summarize what I'm kind of getting, a lot of different things bounce around my head. But for one, it feels to me like, well, yes, I as an ex-Mormon who I can you, you could guess the things that I have to say about Joseph Smith. Um, I could see certain small instances of him adding uh, some good spiritual ideas here and there. But I feel like those are very few and far between. Uh, as opposed to a lot of the things that he instituted that were behind men of his time in terms of different racist ideas um, and ideas about women and polygamy. And you can think of the ways that, um, you know, DNC uh, was instituted and the ways that he was talking on behalf of God. And so what I have a problem with is, yes, you can say like he had some, I can say he had some good ideas, but the Mormon lens is to put his authority as, you know, next to Jesus Christ. The way that he also did talk about himself was that he also said stuff like, um, uh, I've done more for man, you know, uh, like compared to Jesus Christ. You know, that quote from Joseph Smith where he said, I've done more to save the right. souls of Jesus than Jesus Christ because at least my followers haven't left me yet. And there's other quotes from him saying one of my favorites that's actually in 
Hannah Stoddard's book, which I would love to talk to you about your opinions about that faction of Mormonism that has um, the, the traditionalist faction, um, the quotes in, in their book pointing to things like, you know, you will not be able to get to heaven, Joseph Smith says, um, unless you pass through uh, Joseph Smith, that he has to like, okay, your entrance into heaven, or that Joseph Smith said that uh, before you joined the church, you stood on neutral ground and you had uh, the option to choose God or Satan before you. And since you joined the church and you chose God, now if you ever leave it, you only do so by the enticings of Satan. So what I have an issue with is um, it's not like, you know, the smaller things that I'm like, yeah, he probably had some some good ideas that added to the the views around at the time. It's the the 95 percent of the very authoritative takes um, now, are, are those takes all from the pen of Joseph Smith? Because one of the problems I'm finding when I go and, and investigate, actually, let, I'll give an example here. Um, one of the justifications for the priesthood ban was it's in Deseret or it might have been Utah. That's, I think it's actually still Deseret. And Brigham Young at conference starts talking about um, slavery. And he 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 quotes scripture by saying, don't you know that all of, you know, um, uh, the Lord marked Cain with black skin and all of the children of Adam will receive the priesthood before Cain does? He was quoting a scripture, but that scripture doesn't exist. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Book of Mormon. It's not anywhere. But he quotes a scripture that doesn't exist. And everyone around just sort of believes. I mean, like it's in 2024. If someone quotes a scripture, Carol, you can look it up on Gospel Library immediately. And in 1855, you can't do that. H half people are still kind of illiterate. So it's not a thing to go fact check your preacher in the way it is now. So though, but for then generations, people actually believed that there was a legitimate scripture in the Bible that talked about black skin in that way, because it's something that Brigham Young kind of just made up or, or was paraphrasing or who knows what he was doing. But what that shows to me is that someone can incorrectly recollect history or facts and present them as truth and people will believe it and then it becomes standard correlated history until 100 years later where we can we have the technology to realize that something's wrong there so um the problem with some of these quotes about joseph smith or things joseph smith said is they're not coming from joseph they come 30 years after he's dead uh, a lot like like the vast majority of the most controversial things he's saying i don't you don't find them in lectures on faith you don't find them in his writings in oftentimes you find the exact opposite ideas so you know why is is something that you know uh george d watt remembers 10 years after joseph's dead that seems to go along with a, a doctrinal innovation by brigham young that seems to contradict what Joseph himself wrote. Why am I believing that over what Joseph himself said and wrote? You know, mm -hmm. so that's one of the problems where people like people like me have where people are saying, well, look at this horrible thing Joseph said. And I'm like, OK, when was it first recorded? 1875. <laughs> He's been dead for a while. Is there anything that traces to him saying this in any of his own writings early on or anything directly from his mouth to 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 one of his scribes no so to me this is suspect so i take that approach because why would i believe what's what someone wrote that someone else said 20 years after they're dead as opposed to what they're deliberately writing when they're alive you know um joseph smith ran for president of the united states as an emancipationist pretty amazing thing to do especially when he did it you know um but his legacy gets painted as, oh, well, he was this, you know, massive bigot. Well, let's have a real conversation about it. And let's look at what Joseph himself was saying. And it's a lot of it's just absolutely amazing, beautiful stuff. So I don't know. I mean, I, I don't trust people who in hive mind who have a, a narrative and a goal to paint someone with with their school of thought and a, and believe a later attribution of something that reflects their school of thought that may contradict the own words of the person they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's totally fair to say, mm, I'm going to trust Joseph's writings 
only. I think it's totally fair to do that. There are so many Protestants who belong. Uh, I, I've got a friend. He's a big time Protestant. He only believes in the Gospels and the and and the the, the epistles written that weren't Paul. He rejects everything Paul writes because he doesn't think Paul was a legitimate apostle. Um, he thinks Paul's experience on the road to Damascus is a little bit suspect. So he takes the words of Peter and James over Paul. This guy's Protestant. This guy is a member of the Southern Baptist Church. He is, he loves the Lord. He's on the records. He serves it in his church duties. But he, as a, as a sentient being with a soul and a brain, is absolutely allowed to say, I think we're wrong about some of this history here, and I'm not going to accept or pretend to believe in something I think is inaccurate. And I think every single human being has the right to do that. And I don't know why we hold people hostage and say, no, you, you, you've got to accept this other version, even if that version seems a little bit suspect, you know? <laughs> um, I mean, and, 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 and not to derail, but, you know, We've had so much of that. That's what gave birth right now to this polygamy, you know, uh, uh, I don't want to call it polygamy denial because they, <laughs> they don't like that. But, you know, this polygamy questioning movement, you know, with um, the the Rob Fotheringham's and the Jacob Isbell's and, um, oh, the, mo the most, you know, uh, 132 problems. Those people are, are you know, <clears throat> freaking wrecking it on YouTube. They're getting so many views and they're saying we're doubting the narrative of polygamy we don't think joseph was a polygamist and, and now there's a legitimate debate on that <coughs> that's a good thing in my opinion if something seems off in history you shouldn't just have two versions to go with <coughs> manual mainstream mormonism as as taught by the institution and this is exactly how the history is and there's nothing else to learn or you know mormon stories <laughs> nuance ho mormon discussions inc version of history like that's that's insane to me that there's only two versions I'm allowed to pick from. No, you should make your own conclusions. Okay. So um so many different things I'm thinking about. <laughs> For one, um, I don't like that argument. I'll tell you why. Okay. I think it is very convenient, in my honest, straightforward, I think it's very convenient to uh be part of a like a religious idea and um, a group and an identity. And then when people, for instance, who are very harmed by the the actual teachings and instituted policies from those, those, those words and those teachings, those make ideas and those ideas are put forward and they're carried generation to generation. Uh, and people are, are really harmed by them. And my heart is in the sex Mormon space because um, people are very harmed by the authority that the LDS church speaks with and has has carried on these teachings one to another and so it's not just saying like ex-mormons or you know uh, people who are being more antagonistic are saying like joseph smith taught this and you're like well where's that written whatever i think it's it's the way that the church has operated for so long it's like i don't really need to even look for specific quotes even though i do think that's kind of a convenient sidestep from where you're at and and so i just i that's my bold opinion that i think it's it's a convenient sidestep to say, well, where is that written? When that 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 matters, but also um, the actual policies and attitudes overarching uh, from Mormonism's beginning to now are are instituted and, and actual things that have happened because of those teachings. And so, like for instance, it's, it's kind of downplaying Joseph Smith's ideas of himself and his role and his authority. But, you know, my argument back to that would be like, did he not say that Emma would be destroyed if she didn't get on board with polygamy in, in DNC? Like, did Joseph Smith not tell people to invest in his bank that people had these ideas about the authority that he holds from God? Did Joseph Smith not, um, you know, in the Book of Mormon, you don't need to say like, what, what quote did Joseph Smith have here or there? And like in the Book of Mormon that he called the most correct book on earth that people would get closer to it by adhering to its principles than by any other book, did he not put in that book that, you know, the the Lamanites that they are talking about are cursed by God. And then, hey, I want Oliver Cowdery. I know who those Lamanites are. Those Lamanites are the Native Americans. You need to go convert them. You need to go um, teach them and stuff. And so it's it's not a quote here or there. It's the entire uh, conglomeration of everything well, that he yeah, and his, yeah. his uh, successors have taught. Um, well, 
I, w- I would say going back to the beginning, what, so what you just said was this is what you're saying Mormonism is taught. You're saying this is what the, but really what you're saying is this is what leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have taught. But remember, I'm saying Mormon first, mm-hmm. right? So, um, but uh, but just to clarify, the audience that we're talking to, we're not talking to people who are all different branches. You know, our main audience, who right. radio talks to, who I talk to, ninety nine percent of the time are not even FLDS or anything else. They're people who grew up with Hinckley and Monson and President Nelson. Then who leads the church today? those prophets, seers, and revelators also being the ones that speak for God in their lives. So, well, um, yeah, but I mean, yeah. it's still, I mean, we're, we're, I, I'm not, you know, here to defend Howard W. Hunter, although he he was a pretty good guy. He didn't really do, he didn't really, he doesn't really have a lot of quotes people disagree with, but I'm not here to defend Bruce R. McConkie. Like I'm here to say, good. I think <laughs> the idea of, of, I think the spiritual implications of mormonism are absolutely amazing and there should be a space for people to talk about that but whenever that happens people say as well we're you know we're lds or xlds so quick you must relegate your whole beliefs to this institution well what's the point of that that's dumb <laughs> you know like 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 if we both think the institution messed up on certain things and 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 the inst and the institution Lamanite placement program, you know, whatever you want to say that that harmed people. If the only right answer is to say all of Mormonism is bad, the whole philosophy is bad, throw it out the window. Well, then that's just as much of an of, of an authority grab as the people you're accusing, because at the end of the day, if you're saying Mormonism must be defined and relegated by this school of thought or this school of thought, you're doing the same thing like you, you're 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 you're. You may not have this the amount of money or the power as the people you're criticizing, but at the end of the day, you're still taking a philosophy and you're saying it belongs solely to a group of individuals. And we must believe that this version of Mormonism is, is all there is. And I'm saying if the institution has done things we think are wrong, priesthood ban, Lamanite placement program, um, um, e- even the even the way funds were 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 divvied out when being utah was being built and how certain people were starving to if that if we if we think okay that was wrong this is where the institution harmed people why is it wrong for then me to take a step back and go okay i still believe the philosophy that stems from the restored gospel is something that needs to be studied and expanded upon and viewed from different lenses why is that wrong? Like, like, you know, you could say it's sidestepping, but I think it's it, that's more, a more expansive way to look at a philosophy. I mean, do do you really think that, um, you know, uh, uh, if 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 the Har- if Hari Krishna said we are really the only way to view Hinduism, you'd be like that's ridiculous. You know, Iskon, it's great, but Hinduism is expansive, and it, there's so many implications that come with 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 diving into hinduism and what it really means and and when you put a philosophy out there by the way it becomes bigger than the person that just created it you know um you know the the writings of de tocqueville are bigger than him as a person whenever you're saying i am here channeling divine information that i think can save the world that becomes bigger than just you so you know, from, from my perspective, Joseph Smith doesn't have to be, um, Joseph Smith could have made a ton of mistakes. Joseph Smith could have messed up a lot. Joseph Smith is a human being. Um, you look at other 19th century mystics and the what and stuff they were channeling and, and stuff they're putting out into the world. You look at the Neville Goddards, you look at the Rudolph Steiners, you look at the, um, the Guy Ballards and, and the, the Edgar Casey's Joseph Smith was one of those people. Joseph Smith was a mystic who was trying to make sense of this world and was receiving information from something on high and was putting it out into the world. And that is the philosophy that that is the world of Mormonism. That's Mormonism. That is ancient books, um, um, e- uh, Godhood, eternal marriage. That's, that is like a massive expansive field of spirituality. Just because Joseph 
had a failed bank or burned down a printing press or, you know, whatever, or, or I'm not even going to talk to the polygamy because I'm fascinated by the polygamy debate that's currently happening, right? With the, the Rob fathering, I'm fascinated by it. I'm not even touching it because I want to learn more. But to me, that says, wait, wait, wait. Okay, you can have a gripe about Joseph. But what are the implications of the idea of eternal marriage? What are the implications of becoming a god? What does that actually mean? Like, we should pay attention to that. But I feel like what both the the, the toxic aspect of the institution of being the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints and the toxic as aspect of, you know, ex-Mormonism TM, they don't want that. They don't want you to, to view the philosophy by itself and separate the people who want to have, like, control over it. Because idea... Have you seen V for Vendetta? Mm -hmm. You know where he says... I um um. I'm, I'm going to butcher the quote. Um, you may have bullets, but what I have are, are ideas and ideas are bulletproof. And so even though they're shooting him in the alley, he's like, it doesn't matter because the next day you're about to see a million different V's in the street as they're like, that's the idea. They, it doesn't matter how much V ruined his life and messed up and did all these things that were wrong. His ideas of, of the freedom for the people were something really worth fighting for and really worth exploring. And that's why it's caught on. And, you know, I don't know why Mormonism can't have that. I don't know why someone can't be a member of the LDS church. Like, well, it can't, I won't even say they can't, they are. There are people who are members of the LDS church, they're on record, they're members of the LDS church, but they have a more expansive view of Mormonism and it really works. And it's something that a lot of people are, are interested in. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, if I, if I reject the institutional hold on, on on Mormonism and saying that Mormonism must be defined by these, you know, by the LDS Church's um, definition in every way. But then ex-Mormons say, no, Mormonism is also defined by the, ex the LDS Church's definition of Mormonism. And you can't have a third view. Well, then you're kind of doing you're, like you're still upholding the church's authority that you think isn't real, you know? Mm, I have a couple of responses to that. Also, I know I'm monologuing, but I'm trying not to. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, we'll move a little bit faster. No worries. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple of responses to that. And I want to get into ideas about what you just said about it kind of doing the reverse and same thing. But before that, because I think I think what we're kind of talking past each other right now is we're talking about an institution and not just the philosophies, not just like, yeah, we can expand upon the ideas about what Joseph Smith taught about like, uh, becoming a god or becoming um you know the ways that he's linking families together forever and like oh that's an interesting philosophy and idea uh i'm not saying that there isn't ideas to bring up that's one thing but the institution that people actually live their day-to-day -day lives in that to be a member of what i'm talking about and who i speak to you know is the the bergamite branch of people who have grown up sustaining and paying tithing to this LDS church and that their entire lives were dictated by what their church leaders told them was correct. You know, so many women having that spirituality outsourced. And so all these ideas that could be nice to think about of, of an expansive view, that is not what people have been allowed to play around with whatsoever. It's, it's that to be Mormon means that you, uh, you know, you go to church on Sunday, you have to, you know, serve a mission and there's plenty of, you know, modern, teachings from people that you were taught and, and grew up to respect as mouthpieces of God, that they hold authority that you don't have and that dictate the uh, things in your life. So an, an institution that is not allowing anyone to play around with those ideas. Um, and so I don't think that it's just, you know, ex-Mormons dictating that the church has to be that way. I think it's, it's just an honest reflection of what people's lived experiences are based on what the church's proposition is, what it says that it is, that it's this one true church, that these are the mouthpieces of God, stay in the boat, we will not lead you astray. It's people actually having experiences in this institution. And then furthermore, um, the as much as I actually am the, I am the least antagonistic in my actual feelings towards Mormonism, um, in like, there's so many ways I could be Mormon again, if I didn't just full sail, not believe that it's true. Um, but there's, there's actual institutional things that I fear for that would be taught to my kids or that would they would not be protected. Um, and, and the number one reason is I have no faith in the church that if I were to 
raise my kids in the LDS church, that the church led by these, these mouthpieces of God, as they proclaim to be, would do anything to protect my kids if there was some kind of sexual assault or something going on, that they would protect themselves first and foremost. And so what I'm trying to say here is people's experiences is with an authoritative group. It's with somebody not playing around in those ideas. And it's... No, no, I, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. No, I, I no that, but that's what I'm saying. Um, so we have to take, we have to take people, we have to take the words of the prophets and the leaders at their word for what they say they are. And that is what my experience was and the choices but, that I made. That's yeah. what so many ex-Mormons are upset about is being told for so long not to question at all because just even quotes from uh, President Oaks saying like, research is not the answer and things like that. The, this uh, this fearful idea that's been taught for so long about what an apostate is and so many literal ideas about Satan having people under their grasp if they question, you know. Okay, so. Hit me. And th this is, uh, okay, I, I don't want to sound, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here, but, okay, so I, w I was a bit of a mistake, meaning I was not supposed to happen when I was born, Okay. <laughs> I, I was very late. My mother is is much older. Um, she was born in 58. The Civil Rights Act wasn't passed until 1964. Right? So she was well into elementary school before she had rights. Right. Um, you know, you, you look at like you look at the civil rights era and people kind of think it's forever ago because they always show pictures of MLK in black and white. But they had color cameras. They just put it in black and white to make you think it was long ago than it was. People are still alive from it. It wasn't long ago. And I was always raised to view America with a lens of suspicion, and especially the generations that run America with a lens of suspicion. So maybe it's just that lens of I had family directly in the civil rights movement that I, you know, uh, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, I've heard some stories. But when I see Oaks, you know, President Oaks, if he's if he says, you know, uh, uh, research, what, what is the quote you use? Research is not the answer. What is it? Uh, questioning is not the. I have some is a question from somebody who was saying, like, I have some family or friends that are doubting. How should I help them? And basically his response, I think somebody can correct me, is I would suggest that research is not the answer. Right. I don't know how other people and again, this maybe it's a blind spot. Don't just see that as old guys. Like President Nelson is almost 100 years old. He's almost 100. At no point did I ever think that I should just believe every word these guys say. I, I mean, there, there, there's there's no way, you know, they 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 still are part of the wealthy ruling class of our country that has done a lot of things that are wrong. I think they're they're good people in the sense that you can tell that they want to help people, but everyone's mind has blinders and we're still products of our environment. So I don't I mean when the apostles, you know, kind of have that obey, you know, obey obey mindset. In Texas I grew up having to do the American pledge and the Texas pledge of allegiance every day and if I wasn't I got in trouble. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I I we already grew up in in an authoritative culture that says, obey, 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 love the troops, love our wars, respect, wave your flag, don't question and be a good citizen. They're of that generation. They're of that mindset. And so obviously the way they're going to run an institution is going to be similar to that. That's why Liberty University and, 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 and Bob Jones University and so many of these large churches that are run by these above 60 year olds still have that mindset. Because that's how they were raised. But what I'm saying is it may have been harmful. And, and you may have been taught, don't question, don't question. Um, and, and, and you may have really put that in. And you're like, well, I have to listen to these people. But that right there, that, um, and I'm sorry to use this word. I know you're going to cringe a little bit. But that matrix, that, that mind molding, that you know, stay within the system mindset you find in state and in religion. What I'm saying is a deep examination of Mormonism is what can free us from that. Does that make sense? So the institution 
that you're saying is harming people. I'm saying what has built that institution is an amazing philosophy and spiritual idea that could actually release people from the very things that are harmful and that are keeping us these cogs in the machine. Do, do, do you mm-hmm. hear? Do you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> that's where I feel like your new age uh, interpretations and uh, you know glomming a lot of things together. Um, that's where I, I I know where you're kind of going with that. When, when a 75 yeah, year old state president is like, well, brethren. I, I'm very, very happy that um, that that I was alive to see the Negroes finally um, receive the priesthood and 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 become the the true sons of. It's like that is a 75 year old man from Duchesne, Utah. Okay, I I literally am not taking it to heart. <laughs> like, well, it's let's totally talk about fine. let's talk about like in the Jubilee episode that um the the Patreon exclusive that wasn't on the actual Jubilee YouTube video where the question was, is masturbation a sin? Yeah. And yeah. I think, did you stand back in that one? You didn't agree with that it was timber and, and Cardin came forward on that one. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, to be honest, that was a curveball for all of us. And I'm like, do I really, do I really want to walk into a conversation on okay. masturbation? Yeah. And I don't really want to do that. Okay. Cause so, <laughs> so to, to jump off of what you just said, um, cause I, I find this, yeah, this attitude within so many people who are still in the the Mormon church, whatever you kind of want to coin what you believe about that. But yes, in that sphere, who by one standard, it's, you know, this church has a lot of good truth and these are the prophets. We should obey them. Yes, you can get your own revelation, uh, but still follow them. They know the way. Uh, this is the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. And then really downplaying the things that have been taught that cause a lot of harm. And so in that discussion about masturbation, you know, Cardin walks over and he's all kind of like falling over himself laughing of like, oh my gosh, we're really going to do this. And he's Cardin was talking about how masturbation it's, yeah, it's a sin, but it's like a parking ticket. It's like, mm, it's not really a big deal. And then Timber, I think was a lot more serious about it. He's like, yes, it is a sin. And so many people obviously have been taught in the church that sexual sins are are next to murder, as I believe it says in the Book of Mormon. And it's not just, you know, what Cardin was kind of attitude of like, yeah, it's one creepy person asking too many questions, or it's just this, this leader who said these quirky things. Um, and I think it was John who brought up like, no, when, when people are raised believing that this is the prophet and the the only way to fall in line with God and have the spirit with you is to yeah, do some go against your nature, whether that's you know being in a mixed orientation marriage or going against your nature and doing something that's actually pretty normal and healthy, which is like masturbation or something. And uh, I think you know John and the rest of the cast kind of came over and were really serious about it. Like, no, there's that's it's not just a parking ticket. People's entire worlds and and their ideas about themselves and and not being able to tap into that divine. And so if you're saying kind of like, um if we can, we can see that Mormonism is a way to break out of this. I'm like, how in the world do you break out of that when people are taking these prophets at their word saying, don't do this and following it. And Uh, uh, and it's an institution thing to me. Here's my answer. And it's going to sound sophomoric, but think about it for a second after. Um, Taylor Frankie Paul was soft swinging. Mormons in Utah are consistently involved in a lot of wild sexual escapades. So I'm being told at one point that the institution is, is, is is that controlling where it's robbing people of that agency and freedom to explore themselves. On the other hand, go to Provo or Orem. They're wild. The Mormons are wild. It's, it's not the, and I wouldn't say it's in a healthy way. That's where I am disagreeing though. I'm not saying it's, in, in my view, if there was, um, but it's, uh, I'm only finished. If my view is like, yeah, that's so much of Mormons' wildness and ex Mormons' wildness comes out of a dysfunction of not understanding at like actual best practices of uh, you know, sexual health, for instance, and consent. Both Mormons and ex Mormons uh, acting out of a, a not healthy place of, of if there was a church who could teach us the best ideas. Um, and the best practices. So often the church is not only behind the times, but it, you know, says that, you know, there's quotes from leaders about how like we're against the the queers and the feminists and the intellectuals. And so Mormons grow up with this attitude to trust the church's authority over 
anything like a secular world might have to say because it's going to clash with what is supposed to be revealed by these prophets and will downgrade their authority, right? And so what you're talking about is like, no, there's there's lots of dysfunction. There's lots of people who are not adhering to the best morals of, of what the church would teach. But I'm like, it, I think that comes out of the proof to me that they're not prophets who think ahead of their time. And like Natasha Helfer is a good friend of mine who's a sex therapist who was excommunicated from the church. And there's channels like Seawick who after that happened, Greg's on there and he's like, good, because she's teaching that, you know, well, you can what, healthily well, masturbate or whatever. I'm like, well, it's- I'm What like, I'm saying though yeah. is, is if the institution is really that powerful and strong of, of robbing people of sexual liberation, why do we have a state full of people who are so overtly sexually liberated that that's my question like if you think you think explain why you think that <laughs> i don't know how to you think utah is a state that's overly sexually liberated I'm, really yeah hmm, okay i mean on. we we utah and has an extremely high rate of swinging utah has a lot of crazy sex stuff all the time I don't know if we hang out in different circles. Not that I'm, I'm not going to sex parties, but like, I don't like, I, and again, maybe it's, I've lived in the Provo or area too long. Half those BYU students are having sex with each other. 90% of those UVU students are having sex with each other. I don't know. I literally, and I'm not trying to be a gaslight or anything. I legitimately do not see that painted picture of, a million uptight, like, yeah, in the Wilk on Tuesday on BYU campus, you'll find some of those people. The vast majority of members of the church who are below 30, I know, who are unmarried, are not virgins, okay? They, they like, I, I, I don't see that world crafted. Like, I legitimately don't know. And maybe you're not, like, I don't know. I don't know. I just, mm -hmm. I don't see it. Like, if you were to take all of my friends who are all LDS and unmarried, Nine out of ten have had sex multiple times and are 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 you know actively having sex. And then when they decide they want to get serious, they'll stop for a couple months and get a temple recommend and they'll go get married. And I'm I'm not trying to like downplay the faithfulness of the members. I know everyone's gonna be mad about that. That's just kind of the reality of how it looks. So I really don't see mm -hmm. the same world. Like, like I, I'm trying to fill you here. I really don't like I don't see it. I, I I don't. Okay. So if, even if you don't see it, you can at least, I hope, understand the attitude that, I mean, I'm 35 and the way that I was raised, none of my friends, none of my friends had sex before they were married. Uh, and, and mo yeah, almost all of us, yeah, got married in the temple as virgins. And I feel like from the people that I interview on Mormon stories and the people that I interact with, because I get such a diverse amount of um, yeah, ex-Mormons raised from all over. And I do feel like that that is the, the general attitude is they, they do believe the prophets at their word that this is a sin next to murder, whether it's masturbation or premarital sex and have a lot of trauma around, um, yeah, being asked not, not just maybe invasive questions, but also feeling immense amount of shame for, uh, just having nat natural developmental attitudes. Would you deny that, that like the church by and large, generally speaking, if you walk into a, an LDS building and and the, the the general population of bishops and stake presidents are not going to be like, oh, okay, yeah, you had sex. Everybody in Quaker's friend group is having sex too. <laughs> and no, yeah. Um, oh, did that camera turn off? Shit. Oh, I'll turn it back on. All right, can and I will figure out why this camera just turned off. And one sec. Come on, little guy. Did I did I black out here? Oh. Oh, there you go. Oh, there I am. Okay, continue. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, well. I I can't speak to, you know, weird bishop interviews. You know, obviously, I don't think, you know, uh, uh, young girls or boys should be doing the, the worthiness interviews in regard to 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 sexual anything. Um. With a bishop, I think it's kind of weird, um, and I do like that. Now it's an option to have a parent in the room, but I mean, I hate to break it to you: twelve-year-old and thirteen-year-old boys are they're they're we all know, we all know. You can't really, you can't really stop it. Um, but 
I don't know. And, 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 and literally maybe this is my own social blinder here, but I just don't like if, if there are people that said, look, I, I, I trusted and I, I, I literally was taught by the, by the church, um, not to have sex and I didn't, and I never did anything wrong and it totally messed me up sexually. Then like, like that's, that's wrong. Like, like that, that's totally wrong. I guess my question though is if if the institution that is run by that elderly elderly generation in which that was the norm how they were growing up and that's really what they're putting out now I want to ask are the ramifications of that as bad as what you're saying because in my lived experience I, I literally just don't see it um and maybe I thought you were like 29 by the way I didn't think you were 35 but like maybe the the it's the cultures changed that quickly you know maybe it really has um, and again, also maybe it's the industry I work in. I work in festivals and concerts and parties, right? So the people I'm I'm exposed to are a little bit different than you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're you're you run of the mill guy who's having a Sunday picnic, you know, with his 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 ward chorister girlfriend. I don't know, but I really just like I think if you were to go and poll all of the Mormon YSA areas, Rexburg, Provo, Gilbert, Mesa. I think you'd find that the majority are not virgins at all. And in your opinion, though, and that shows that the institutional like stranglehold on on on, on sexual like uh, uh you know what's the word I'm looking for um that th the institution that has a stranglehold in people's sexual lives and it stops them from exploring themselves. I'm saying I don't think that stranglehold is that powerful at all if the vast majority just are unfazed by it and are doing what they want like they, that's some my point question though are they unfazed by it because i would say that people are you know they get a little bit close and they end up having sex and yeah they're not virgins anymore but are they unfazed by it or are they filled with immense amount of guilt because that would be uh what my experience is from the people that i have talked to that it's been a soul crushing amount of guilt and shame uh that you know if there if there's a maker and he wants you to know him and he has these tenants and these ordinances and you can understand them through the temple um i just don't think that uh, the shame that mormonism and and the instead of being a, uh, a a forward proposition of something that is so enlightening it's like you know do your best and if you can't you still could be with your family it's a absolutely don't do this don't touch it don't cross the line or else you will be separated from your family it's a very negative proposition and so people are operating from a place of fear a, a place of shame is how i would say and so it's like are they unfazed it's like no i think people are are scared and they're repressed for the most part and then if they go a little bit too far they're still stuck in shame and repression but they think that the the only way because the way that they've been taught is that this is where the the medicine is so they it, the way the way John and I honestly talk about it, and a lot of people in the experiment space is is a church that uh, makes you sick in a way by telling you to go against some things that are it's not just about sex, it's about a lot of different things um, that that give you the, the the sickness and then tell you that they're their prescription, and then you're on this nonstop hamster wheel, but you're still operating from a place of of shame and fear. And the camera went off again. You can talk though; it's still um, yeah. I mean. Uh Perhaps, you know, I mean, if, if that's someone's experience, that's their experience. I'm not going to I'm not going to be like, oh, well, you know, your experience is invalid. But would you um, say, hold on, let me stop you. Would you not just that it's their experience, but would you deny that that is systemic across the ways that people live Mormonism? Well, there for there to be a system, people have to participate in it. And what I'm saying is from my lived experience, that doesn't seem to be the ramifications of it. So I'm doubting how strong that stranglehold is if the – and again, we're, we're, we're operating off of like without actual firm numbers here, right? But I would venture to say the majority of the Mormon YSA pockets in America are full of non-virgins. And of those non-virgins, it's people who aren't – don't really have sexual trauma. Um, and and, and then that, that's me being 100% honest. Like mm -hmm. I think if you were to show this video – to people in Gilbert, Mesa, Provo, Orem, Rexburg, who are under 30, they'd go, yeah, it seems about right. I mean, have you ever, <laughs> well, I, another thing is what, is, what is one of the biggest um, economic opportunities for YSA men in, in Mormon culture? 
it's it's summer sales. It's door to door sales, right? We send out thousands and thousands every year. The summer sales culture is not sexually repressed whatsoever, whatsoever. It is so much of it is make a lot of money, get a nice car, go to the gym, get hot and get hot chicks. Like that is literally these guys are like want to be Jordan Belfort types. Like Mm -hmm. obviously they want to stay members of the church, but they're trying to go wild. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've just seen so much of that. That's why I, when I, when I, when I hear the conversations around like the Mormon sexual repression, I'm always like, did you live in a different Provo than me? Cause I really don't, I don't know. Uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Yeah. Let me, let me side, side, um, tangent to, to one thing because the church is so conservative and from, from the top down, I'm saying, uh, I, I would, I would venture to guess that the, church leaders themselves would be like a pro abstinence education yeah, in for schools, sure. right? For so sure. we know though that like abstinence only education actually leads to more pregnancies and leads to more STDs and people not knowing how, you know, when they are going to be sexually active, how to, you know, uh, ask for consent and so those things. And so if the topic at, at hand here is what I would say is like the best tools to live the healthiest life that cause the least amount of harm. Do Mormons either living the tenets of the church, do they, do they live that, that life? And then ones who would, what I would feel like what you're saying is people who uh, are able to live these other types of not so sexually oppressed lives and are, and are not following the rules of, of Mormonism as much. I still don't think either of those lead to the happiest, healthiest uh, sexual development because neither is giving people the uh, information. I, I agree. Right. And so hundred percent agree. So, yeah, yeah. So the, the aspect that I'm most worried about, if we're circling back to ideas about, you know, the Mormonism and Joseph Smith, having these, these new, more expansive, helpful ideas. I'm like, well, in 2024, if how is, how it is actually manifesting today, it still does not, uh, curb and it, it doesn't actually be, it's not forwarding the things regardless that we can tell from, from science and, and psychological best practices. And that's, that's where my issue is. And so it's, so my, my was... last point is just that it's, even if there are, are Mormons who are out having sex and so forth, I'm still worried that they were not taught ideas about consent because they're still so informed by the patriarchy. I can't tell you how many um, friends when I was Mormon who told me that they were sexually assaulted while they were Mormon. And I didn't I didn't believe them at first because I'm like, no, like Mormon guys wouldn't do that. Like, no, you know, and oh, like yeah, and not believing would. women because of uh, yeah, I still think that even if there is that kind of sex going on, I can't believe that it's doing anything to to actually forward like less harm by people because the ways that they're in, in, interacting uh, are are not informed by you know best practices. So no, I, I I agree with everything you said. So here's my thought on that though is what you're and it, effectively what you're saying is the ramifications um, as as played out by the harmful parts of a purity culture can create. Um, people who are, who, are, who are sexually unintelligent and even harmful, where then you have people that grew up repressed and then their their minds are warped. And so now when they want to go wild, they end up becoming more on the R-A-P-I-S-T side. All right. Mm-hmm. There, there's things like that that happen. Um, however, that problem, as evil as it is, is heavy in the Every college with a big, with a large frat community has that massive problem, right? Right. Um, most of the problems you're describing are problems that that are part of North American culture. I mean, half the, how many men in America are are addicted to pornography, like addicted to it, right? I mean, it 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 is creating a mental pandemic in the country. So, if those problems that we're talking about, that come runway of institutional teachings by people of the elder generation and that same elder generation is still running the other institution in this country religious and non-religious and they're having the same problems to me the answer isn't to say well that means mormonism is bad it's again the people running those institutions and and 
that elderly generation whose mindset is still in the 40s and 50s does not translate to 2024. And so the ramifications of that are harmful for people. But if I if I can't find that solely in Mormonism, to me, that says that can't be a Mormon problem. And the real solution isn't necessarily to say, OK, well, this will stop if the LDS church is destroyed, because let me tell you, there are, <laughs> at Florida State, I guarantee you there are a lot of R.A.P.I.S.T.S. out there. OK, at, 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 at UC Berkeley, I guarantee you there are a lot of R.A.P.I.S.T.S. out there. So and, and, and there's sexual inefficacy and there's sexual uh, 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 addictions all throughout the country that don't stem from Mormonism at all, but are the same things we say played out in Utah and Idaho and Arizona. So if that's the case, then stopping institution won't stop that. You know, um, uh, stopping getting, if, if the LDS church disappeared tomorrow, that class, that, 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 that class of being that class of person who is either addicted to porn, um, or, you know, uh, uh, sexually harming people, they're not going to disappear. So I would then have to say, what is the problem then? You know, and all the, all the things we're naming that are harmful about the institution are, again, those things that are harmful about Western American culture. And it's because of that elder generation that is still running everything. The same problems we have about misogyny in the church um, um, I guarantee, you know, what was it last or last Sunday, the, you know, the, the movement there was to skip church. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take a wild guess and say, none of those women are voting for Donald Trump. I'm just going to take a wild guess and assume the vast majority aren't. And, and, you know, what, so if they're writing columns, they're saying, you know, LDS church has built in misogyny. Okay, if the church disappeared tomorrow, if every chapel and temple was gone and Temple Square was a giant park tomorrow, Donald Trump would still be the Republican nominee and his kind of thinking about women would still be prevalent in the country. Porn would still be an addiction. R.A.P.I.S.T.S. would still be running around. We would still have movies that glorify um, sexual violence, sexual assault. That would all still exist. So, but I know it, it's, I, I don't, I, I see what you're saying, but I'm, I'm saying, I think, I don't think the solution is burn down the institution. I think the solution is <laughs> burn down all the institutions, rethink the entire world we're born into, completely rebel against, against the order and, and, and the way our minds are molded from children to now. It's in public education. It's in government. It's in film. It's in music. It's in everything that makes money for the top 10%. It's it's 100% there. Getting rid of Mormonism isn't going to stop that, you know. Um, so, yeah, I do agree that the institution, yeah, can create some of those problems. And, and that is harmful and that is wrong. And those people have had a lot of joy taken out of their lives. But at the same time, that is a problem of that 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 is not a problem inherent to mormonism specifically that's a problem that comes from the elder generation and the institutions that run a country and i mean i obviously i've heard elder holland say sexual sins next to murder i think that's a misinterpretation of the book of mormon um i don't believe it's saying sexual sins next to murder he's he's describing um the 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 rampant um horrific lifestyle um that uh that you know he's 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 purchasing prostitutes and he's lying and he's stealing people he's just becoming a terrible person and he's destroying the actual belief in god of other people he's destroying their divine connection and he says don't you know that these things are next to murder he doesn't single out you know sexual sin so i think again that's the interpretation that comes from that post puritan 1930s 40s and 50s perspective that we've read into the scripture and now with that perspective it can be harmful but for people like me that are saying, why don't we read it without that those lens, without those goggles? And actually, it's going to help fix the problems that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, all right. I'm going to go back and forth. Let's do as many questions as we can. Okay. And one, so what you're saying, you know, don't burn down Mormonism, burn down this entire kind of 
all these kinds of institutions. So to somebody who's listening, who let's say is LDS, uh, and they have been taught these ideas about sexual sin being next to murder, and they do take the prophets at their word um, that, you know, homosexuality is not okay. You can name a, a teaching from the prophets and leaders of the last 30 years, and that is how they view their life, and they're on that more orthodox view of Mormonism, uh, who hold the, the prophets in this high uh, esteem and sustaining them. What would you say to them, though? Because it sounds like you're downgrading the authority that 99% of so many LDS people have, and they don't feel like they can have have that type of, you know, uh, wish wishful thinking about not 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 this orthodox view. So, what would you say to people who do have that view within the LDS Church? Um, I would say, um, so I would say, first the the. The things we hear consistently in church, like, okay, one phrase is, um, the church is true. Okay. What does that actually mean that the church is true? What, what is it? Does it mean that, um, it's the, you know, or it's the only true and living church on the face of the earth? What does that actually mean? You know, um, when, when Jesus organized his church, it wasn't a 501c3 tax, tax deductible organization, right? Um, Church in, in Greek means ecclesia, which means awakened ones or called out ones. And with that perspective of what the scriptures are communicating, you then have to think, okay, well, n- no, I don't have to take everything the prophets and apostles say as, and, and no one should. The only reason people do take their religious leaders' words as, as 100% truth is because we're molded in our society to trust the leader. We're molded with with follow the leader consciousness, which we should not have. Um, and uh, so, just to get you on record, like the LDS Church itself, who today in 2024 who's singing "Follow the Prophet, Follow the Prophet," he knows the way in Sunday school. You do you not think that that should be a primary song? Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's whatever. I mean, because it's like I, it's one thing to say. Here's here's my problem, Quiku. Okay, you've talked for a while. I'm gonna say something. Okay, yeah, here's go, my go. problem, dude. It's just that um, I get it. Like I totally get it. Trust me, I get you. The problem though is that in the way that the church is right now, though, it's it's in one way you can say I'm, I I live Mormonism this way and I view these things this way, but it's like, well, then what what does that matter? Like I put my, my money where my mouth is. I put my, people speak with their feet. They speak with their dollars, you know? And so it really doesn't matter how much progressive Mormons, whoever, what they can say about what they believe Mormonism is. If the adherence is still like, this is Quaco and he's on word radio and he's making these apologist videos and he's explaining why Joseph Smith wasn't that bad of a guy. And at the end of the day, it is helping Mormons with their cognitive dissonance, feeling really badly about what the church that they send their tithing money to helping with the cognitive dissonance about the church today, doing things that are that authoritative, that they're not burning it down. So it's like, well, you can have these, these ideas about what, how you view Mormonism. I'm like, what, what difference does it make if the actual institution is still going to be piping hot, you know, bullshit out of the pulpit that people are still going to choke down and and have harmful teaches, teachings being perpetuated um, over and over again. Does that make sense? That's where I'm at, where I'm like, what's, what difference does it make if, if it's like people who have the opinions that you're having aren't asking for like what should be different or what people should, should uh, uh, weigh out for themselves and actually question the authority? Well, like a call to something. Okay, I know there's a lot of people that are going to ask me to 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 fight everything you just said and and way, it. but I'm not going to I'm just going to say let, let's take let's say what you just said is, is is accurate and true, okay? You can't take something down without replacing it with something else or else you just have mass destruction. So, when we did that dialogue with RFM, one of the most standout points of it was oh I know you're going with yeah this. when yeah. he was asked are you know do you feel any sort of responsibility to collect and help the people whose faith you played a role in destroying and he says no and Cardin stands up and says you just quoted Cain you think you're not your brother's keeper but 
we are. So I okay. actually, when I watched that, just for the record, I was surprised that he said that, and I disagree with that, and I'll explain in a minute, but keep right. going. Well, so, so, so um, you know, w- whether we like it or not, when a philosophy is on Earth, it's on Earth. We know it. Like, like, let, I'll tell you, Mustache Man in the 1940s was really, really bad. But unfortunately, his philosophy is still here. When when an idea gets into the world, it doesn't go away. It's there and it's there to stay. So um, people who want to see the world wake up from the spell or the matrix, as some of us call it, you know, Andrew Tate kind of hijacked that word, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the OGs were using it before him. Um, the people who 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 legitimately want to see people liberated from the mind molds of manipulation that we're all born into. Those people aren't ju- don't just want to put all their eggs in the basket of hey this institution's bad, but we want to examine what 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 it's relying upon that makes people enjoy it, and the things that that the LDS Church is relying upon is the restored gospel. So, you know, there there's a place for people like you who say, well, okay, well, institution promotes X Y Z, which I think are bad. So anyone who doesn't believe in X, Y, Z should leave the institution and should, um, uh, you know, leave that whole world behind. But it just that's not how society works. I mean, literally, the, the, the proof is in the pudding with the alt-right. You can kill Mustache Man and you can destroy his leaders. The philosophy stays. But unless you let the 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 you let a philosophy. um turn into something good and vibrant it doesn't go away and so what you consider to be harmful will not disappear like you don't think tomorrow if the lds church disappears the apostolic united brethren wouldn't gain a ton of num- a ton of numbers and be the terrifying thing mm-hmm. behind the villain like the actual villain you thought was there it's like oh the lds church is gone and here comes the aub and you'd be like oh my goodness Oh my gosh, they make Dallin H. Oaks look like Billy on the street. So again, philosophy doesn't go away, mm-hmm. you know? And so what difference does it make is, is we have to fight for ideas. Ideas are the most important thing. Institutions come and go, but I, 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 ideas are the things that like shape our mind. The, the same stuff that you hate in politics, that whole thing, like, like you do not like the ideas espoused by Ron DeSantis. I'm just going to assume that, right? Correct. Okay. But just because... Gracie, would you be getting me some water in the kitchen? I would love you for everything so much. But like if Ron DeSantis disappears tomorrow, that whole philosophy is still there. But what? But why do people like it? Well, the, 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 the good aspects of it, because they say, I want to protect my family. I want to make sure that I uh, I have enough money to, to live my life peacefully. That's what I find in, 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 the, in conservatism. And that's what I believe in. And so you have to honor that and say, okay, I see the beautiful part of that worldview. And upon that worldview, we have various institutions. And of the institutions, many have made mistakes. But do you see what happens? If you knock down the buildings, the foundation is still there. But the foundation has to be wrestled with. And so the way to wrestle with that foundation is, you know, to to dive into it, to look at it with new eyes, to come up with different ideas. Remember, Mormonism is only 200 years old. It's it's a baby in compared with with the philosophies that have shaped our, our entire world, especially, you know, in, in contrast with the East. So there's so much time. So, you, you know, you say what difference does it make? But I think it makes the whole difference. I, I think this battleground for ideas and trying to come up with 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 these real reasons that can that can shape us all. I think that's the most important thing. You know, um, Russell Nelson won't be alive in three years. Down late chokes won't be alive in 10. Henry B. Iron won't be alive in 10. Jeffrey R. Holland probably won't be alive in 10. But Mormonism will still exist. And it may look different in 30 years than it does now, which looked different than it did 30 years ago. But but the future of it, it depends on the people that are willing to bring in these new ideas and are willing to, to you know, to shake things up and to make us look at scriptures from, from different perspectives and new eyes and, and question just manualized history. Um, so I think it makes a huge, huge difference, but it may, it doesn't give you the immediate, you know, like, 
it, it doesn't give you the immediate gratification, you know, from 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 your perspective. But in the long run, like if you like Kara, I can tell you care about people. You really care about people and you are aware and you have empathy for people's, you know, emotional struggles and their mental struggles that have come from them being a part of the LDS church, right? That, that that's what your whole channel is based on. You know, like it's it's, it's pretty clear. Yes. Those, th those struggles that come from, those struggles will always be attached to the idea and the implications of the restored gospel and Mormonism. And so my mind is I want to go and fight at the idea level. Because when you are both dead, Mormonism will still be here. But what's, what's the impact it's going to have in the world? Is it going to be, from your perspective, a net good in 100 years? And if it is, don't you want it on earth? Or is it going to be, you know, so, so, so I think it matters a ton. I think it matters almost more than the institutional squabbles because, you know, people die. Nelson won't be here soon. These, these people that were, you know, angry about, they're, they're, they're going to be gone, but the ideas will still be here. So, and that's actually where Jacob Hansen and I kind of agree where we're, where we believe the idea is really the battle, the battleground. Um, Cause I mean, look at our country. Institutions are going to do what institutions are going to do. Billionaires are going to do what billionaires are going to do. Like, that's just kind of how it is. And it's not going anywhere, you know? I mean, they get $160 billion. Church isn't going anywhere. It's it's here, right? So, so if you really do care about making people's hearts, minds, and spirits better in the Mormon space, then I think we got to go with the ideas. With the ideas. Okay, so many things to say. A lot of people in the comment section Oh, we're like not understanding what you were saying and where you're going with this. Uh, but if we want to just go back to what you said at the beginning, I totally I understand that argument very well. Again, I used to be a very conservative person who would make that argument about how, you know, you get rid of ex religious institution or we the world moves slowly more secular and leftist. Um, what are you leaving and or, or what are you replacing it with? And um, I have my opinions on that, but I. I, I look in terms of things, uh, there's a great, do you know, um, thinker on thoughts, uh, Jonathan Streeter. Yeah. Yeah. I think of a lot of the podcasts that he's given and one of his analogies is about, uh, Thomas Edison and he went through like something like 5,000 different filaments to see what would spark and turn the light bulb on with, with Thomas Edison. And to me, Mormonism is an idea that came about the Book of Mormon. You could ask any, you know, historian of that that you know century that knows that that frontier landscape, and every historian would say, yes, the Book of Mormon answers the question that people at that exact time period were looking to have answered. Or, um, and and it's it's not written for our day <laughs> in that way. That the 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 Book of Mormon and the coming about of Mormonism with Joseph Smith is a product of its time that is still carrying. 200 years later. And so when I look back at how it came to be and the teachings that are still in the Book of Mormon today, that there are a lot of racist ideas. Obviously, there's a lot of things that are just not helpful for human flourishing that are in See, yeah, and to I people. Think it's, I think it's anti-racism. All right. We'll talk about it in a second. <laughs> okay, okay. You do not get the black card and just argue with me and we're just kidding. Okay. But we, I, I, I think that, um, yeah, the uh, the Edison analogy is apt for so many ex-Mormons or just people who never convert in the first place because the proposition of Mormonism is such and such and such. This is the Book of Mormon. It's restored. These are the, you know, tenets that you need to live by and you'll grow closer to God and live with your family forever. Not only are less people getting baptized than than were before, more people are leaving, you know, and I think it's similar to the Edison analogy where it's you've seen it, you've tried it, you've, you've looked at what it teaches and it's just not turning on that light bulb. It's just not a true thing. And yes, it can be discarded. That's my opinion. Right. And like, it's, 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 uh, almost a false equivalency in my opinion to, to equate that with, you know, discarding all spiritualism or all, all that Mormonism that is good that it has to offer. Um, as I just spoke at thrive, two days ago, which is an ex-Mormon conference, go thrive. You need ex-Mormon community, thrivebeyondreligion.com. And most of my entire speech was, uh, 
yes, it was a lot about uh, raising consciousness. And in Mormonism, I had a I had a roadmap of how to do that, of how to uh, achieve my next highest levels of consciousness. And what I believe is different than what RFM said, that I do believe that us as an entire human race or anything that has any kind of consciousness to it, we do have to um, work on ourselves and be uh, able to go into the places where our wounds are and how they're making us act out so that we can cause less harm to other people. Because if you're not you know, getting to work within yourself, you're going to be acting so uh, un unconsciously. And my, my ideas about what to do as a post-Mormon at first, I didn't know what it would be because I was told wholesale, this is where your spirituality lies. So that is why, yes, people go through nihilism phases and, and and turn to atheism and stuff. But I just think that the proposition of Mormonism is something that can and should be rejected. But here's my caveat is um, a lot of my talk that I gave this week was also about shadow work and also integrating things that um, we are told we from our, you know, integrating things in, into the shadow or integrating things from the shadow. And so, for that, for me personally, after being out of the church for four years, a lot of that are things that I, I like from Mormonism, quote unquote, but were told to me by Mormonism kind of owns that idea. And so that is things to do with like my family. And I talk about how I love my family and my kids more now because I have done that work to integrate aspects of Mormonism and I hold things more dearly now than I did before because I know myself better. And so I don't think it's a wholesale like, you know, what you replace this with. I think it is more like we know that these things do not add up to believe in Mormonism today. Different than, you know, what what your aspects of, of how you interpret things. But I would say for the majority, you, you still have to believe that you can your uh, your spirituality is so outsourced to these men in authority and you need to pass a temple recommend interview. Like it said in Mormonism that if you're worried, if you're going to get into heaven, you will know if you can pass a temple recommend interview. I, I just think that it is uh, enough things have added up to, for people to say, this does not light anymore. And then just like Thomas Edison, you throw out that filament and you try something new and you try something new. And as you go through those different progressions, you're going to mess up because that is life. But if it is still within this container, within this box of Mormonism, you don't have that freedom. I think you have that freedom outside of Mormonism to 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 play in different spaces, to mess up, to not be, like I said before, uh, living a, a life based that, that's grown out of shame, that's grown out of a fear of, of if you mess up. But as you go along that and then you integrate the things that you like as you go along, that's that's what I think every person who leaves the church uh, should at least think about. and. Uh, that that's what helps kind of raise our consciousness as a, a humanity. I don't think that the LDS church, because it is an authoritarian dogmatic structure overall in the ways that people are raised within it. I don't think that raises people's consciousness. I think that that pushes us backwards. Well, um, so I, I hear what you're saying. I think that the, damn it, whatever this position is, that camera didn't work. This one, whatever, whatever it is. Why it, it keeps turning off. Um, right. so, you know, first I'd say that again, I think you're, you're, you are uniting. I'm not sure if just in your mind you're doing this or for sake of your viewers, Mormonism with the LDS church, but you've got to separate the two because I, I guarantee if you sat Josh Gailey down right here, one of the leaders in, um, church of Jesus Christ bigger tonight. They've got a couple different chapels all over Pennsylvania. I think the third largest LDS church or even like Denver snuffer, you know, or one of those sat some down. They would say you have complete, you are still believing the authority of the LDS church because you believe you're, you're saying the full, the religious idea of Mormonism is dictated by one institution. So, but that can't be true. I can still, if I disagree with what a Presbyterian says, it doesn't mean that I am throwing out all of Protestantism. And so, you know, you, you said that, um, you know, that use the Thomas Edison analogy from that you got from, from uh, Jonathan Schreeder. Well, one, I, again, Mormonism is only 200 years old. You know, this idea that a 
a philosophy is done after 200 years because you know some people in one institution decide to a bunch decide to leave that you you can't measure the weight of 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 a spiritual movement or a philosophy by that you can't do it i mean uh there there aren't as many zoroastrians as there were but the zendavesta still stands zoroastrianism still yeah. stands right um so I, I I think what you're saying is Mormonism is only as good as the institu- as the power of that the institution has, but that is still believing that the inst like you're still giving more credence to the institution that you don't believe in. Do, do you see what I'm saying? So so, um, and 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 you, you you say well those are 19th century ideas. You know scholars have looked at it. That's still authority consciousness you're following. You're still saying well. The, the PhDs and the smart people have done have said this thing, so I must believe them. You're still falling into the same authority consciousness that you found harmful in well, the LDS church. Yeah. Let me, you know, like, let me but, respond really quick. So I think that's fair. I think that, you know, I can, I'm speaking to, again, people who were raised in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who usually have left it. We're talking about, well, I've, I'm friends with a lot of Mormon historians and I love Ben Park and his... Uh, his story of of retelling Mormonism start to finish in American Zion is really thorough and interesting. But, you know, when people think of Mormonism and what it is, it is what Benjamin Park talks about. It's this story of Joseph Smith from this to this to this. And it is, again, this uh, proposition of authority. So I'm not saying that. I'm saying this is what it was taught to me. And this is what its proposition to the world is, is a proposition of authority. And so, no, I'm not saying like, I'm still... Uh, holding on i don't know it sounds like you're kind of saying that i'm i'm saying that i hold on to their authority stronger than they do no no you're i'm saying you're saying that mormonism is defined by the lds church's claim of authority over it but i'm saying if you can't separate mormonism from the lds church then you have kind of tricked yourself into still falling into the same consciousness as you were before of the thing you don't like because Again, ideas are bulletproof. Ideas don't go away. But if you're saying the idea of Mormonism does not work because of the way I've been taught it by the LDS Church, you're not letting the uh, the religion or you're not letting the philosophy breathe. You're still acknowledging. You're still letting the church have authority over the ideas. But as someone who's ex-Mormon, theoretically, you should be able to not only separate yourself from the LDS Church. You should be able to separate Mormonism from the LDS Church. You should be able to, like, you know. Okay, you yeah, be able, it's kind yeah, of going yeah. back to the discussion we had earlier about Joseph Smith saying that he came to restore the gospel and not the kingdom. Is that kind of where you're going? Yes, and this is again, and this is where I get in trouble in Ward Radio. Okay, this is where I get in trouble, but whatever. So um, here, wait, let's pause on that because that's interesting. That is a lot of people who have a more conservative, mainstream, orthodox view. Where I'm, I think that's that's honestly an interesting thing to add that we shouldn't sidestep that you get in trouble for those things because what you're saying right now is yeah one way to look at Mormonism that probably isn't very orthodox and very common um, and I would say I think does uh, like a disingenuous uh, feeling towards the being your brother's keeper of honestly engaging with what people as they experience the orthodoxy as they're raising it what that authority has actually played out in their life to detrimental ways you yeah, follow well, me yeah, like, yeah i think i think to be the most christ conscious in in the most expansive way outside of mormonism at all or mormonism can be like a a window into those higher states of, of consciousness i think that the the best way to do that is to yes like be your brother's keeper and to mourn with those that mourn which so often i feel like that is the opposite of what word, word radio does and so many mormon podcasters it's it is uh dis uh distancing themselves from the pain that is actually caused by these doctrines and things that just don't work for people as they go through their life as a Mormon and mocking them in that pain saying that's a you problem instead of an institution problem. And that's, I think, well, I mean, there's no doubt that not everyone's path is the same. Some people legitimately do not connect with the Mormon philosophy at all or, or anything of its implications. Some people, it's just not your path. We're not all going to have the same path. I mean, that that's absolutely clear. You know what Jesus says in the New Testament? 
He says, if a man says, look here, look, there is the kingdom of God, believe him not for the kingdom of heaven is within, right? One of the most important verses in the Bible, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within. Joseph Smith says the church and the kingdom of God are separate things. The book of Mormon ends with there being no church, but nothing more than one person trying to connect to the kingdom of heaven. There is a trail here of, 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 of an idea that is still Mormon, but may differentiate from the manual perspective. But I want to explore that one. There's enough people. We have 9,000 Come Follow Me podcasts, right? There's enough people giving the, the manual version. I'm saying, though, like me, me, I want to explore that side of it. Because if that side is ultimately when what I believe Joseph Smith was trying to convey to the world, then it's definitely worth exploring. And it's definitely going to last. If people, I'm not here to say people didn't have their experiences. You know, I'm not here to say, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, who, who's who's the, the the creepy Colorado former state president, McConkie's grandson, who is mm -hmm. a, you know, kid diddler and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to say that's like, I'm not here to say that doesn't happen. No, that's evil. It's wrong. I mean, absolutely. And that guy had a, a position in the church and he abused it. And he was allowed to do that for so long because there weren't systems in place that were able to catch him. And he was evil. Not was, he's alive. So he is evil, okay? Completely, completely. That can still be true and people can still have those experiences while I also say, okay, I want to know everything I can about what OG Joseph Smith was trying to bring because from my research, it seems as if it's a message that could fix the very problems we're fighting against right now. Um, this is something else people don't want to say. In the Book of Mormon, the churches are are often the villains. You know, oh, you love your your you love your fine temples and your jewelry, right? There's the whole part of the Book of Mormon where it talks about the churches are actually corrupt, and the Book of Mormon ends with there being no church. You know, so I'm not sure how much of a 19th century idea that is. But I think it's really relevant in 2024. Mm -hmm. um, I think the Book of Mormon is extremely relevant in 2024, especially with regard to the downfall of the civilization and how people become extremely separated, cold hearted and vicious towards one another. Um, the Book of Mormon is extremely prophetic in, in, in regards to um, how how uh, divide and conquer tactics leave everyone dead. I think it's extremely prophetic in in in, in regard to the subject of race relations. Um, I, th I think it's extreme prophetic for today, but that's also because I decided to go and read it without any kind of, you know, institution blinders. I said, I'm going to read this and I'm going to, I'm going to come to the conclusions by just what, you know, my consciousness and my mind are saying. And sometimes I get a different interpretation, but, but those different interpretations are worth discussing in the public square because they may actually lead to the solutions that we both agree, uh, what solutions to problems we both agree here are real problems. Mm -hmm. Um, so me saying this isn't to go and say, Oh, well, you know, Oh, you, you didn't really experience that. You're just, uh, you know, you, you, or, or, or there's, you should never complain about what happened in the church. I, I have made fun of my experience at BYU and my horror time I had sometimes at BYU with the honor code office. You're I, I have criticized the church plenty of times online and, and, and video on record. Right. Plenty, plenty of times. So, you know, um, I'm, I, I think I think there's definitely room for both. Um, but I I just don't want to fall into any kind of consciousness that disallows me to examine an idea outside of the people who claim to own that idea. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you a follow up then. So you believe in the Book of Mormon? The title of this uh, is "Is the Book of Mormon True?" Which I hope we can get into that more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As uh, we keep going, you tell me how much time you have left. We're at two hours and four minutes right now. Oh my gosh! People are listening to me for two hours. They're gonna lose their minds. Did you know we have we've had up to like eight hundred and fifty people in the live stream right now? So thank you guys. Yeah. Wow. So. 
uh, I'm, I'm a, my phone is, I can't see my phone screen. It's flipped over for a reason. Cause I job. know the minute I flip it, it's going to be missed calls, text. <laughs> what are you doing? I'm having I, fun. I'm having fun. I can stay for as long as you're, you want to, cause I do want to get into some more things, but you tell me when you're ready to wrap up. And so I have Dan Vogel, probably the most, I would say, prominent historian of Joseph Smith's life and work is actually in the chat. And oh, great. so um, as you have been talking, I have been uh, highlighting a couple things that Dan Vogel has to say. And if you don't know who that is, please go check out his YouTube channel and his work. I really like a lot of the things that he discusses and has investigated. And he does bring up a, a good point that I wanted to ask. So if we eventually those lights are going to be going off. Um, the Book of Mormon being true through whatever revelatory process we can get into that you believe that it did come about by, let's just baseline say the power and spirit of God, um, a revelation of some kind. So Dan says, Joseph Smith set up the institution by the same inspiration by which he translated the Book of Mormon. Um, I feel like what he's trying to get at there is uh, a lot of what I have is the, I, I take people at their word when they say that they speak on behalf of God and they're restoring something. And this is the way to know their maker. It's through reading this book and through this institution, that's the same power. Uh, but if you believe the book of Mormon is true, but it's like, do you also have to believe the institution in which Joseph Smith set up through that same <laughs> revelatory process? Your um, thoughts. I'm trying to, I already know I'm going to get clipped in memes. I may as well say whatever. Do you know who uh, Patrice O'Neill, the comedian, is? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, there is this clip I saw of him on TikTok. And he uses the most vulgar um, explanation for exactly what you're talking about. And he says, look, if you see a guy, I'll, I'll, I'll filter it to make it sound less uh, uh, ridiculous. Um, if you see a guy bashing himself in the head with a lamp. Okay. And then he stops and he says, two plus two is four. And he keeps bashing himself in the head with the lamp. Does that mean two plus two isn't four? No, no. Right. Um, uh, if, if, um, you know, um, uh, Pythagoras gives us a Pythagorean theorem. And at the same time, starts a bizarre cult, <laughs> this, the weird Pythagorean cult. It doesn't mean A squared plus B squared isn't equal C squared. Mm -hmm. People are asking me to interrupt you more. So I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry. Oh, no, no. My camera went off. Well, I guess I can't. Continue. Oh, so, <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, Dan Vogel can say, oh, well, you know, I, I think it was all a sham. But that just comes down to, I guess, that, that debate on what the Book of Mormon is saying. You know, is it, is it real? What you know was Nephi real? Did Jesus really visit the Americas? Um, and I mean th that's that's where the debate is. And non LDS people who believe in the Book of Mormon would still affirm affirm that it's true. And 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 that's kind of hints to what I've kind of been the dead horse I've been beating the whole time is um, the Strangites don't have the same uh, history as the L as the LDS Church, but they still believe in the Book of Mormon. You know, when when I talk with Josh Gailey from the Baker Tonight's, who have quite a bit of members, they're kind of forgotten about, but they're they're still a pretty relevant church within the Northeast. Um, half the time, when people are talking to him about, you know, what about the temple? He's like, we don't. We're the we're the 1830 church. We don't have a temple. It's like, well, well, the garments. We don't, he goes, we don't have garments. Doctrine and covenant. We we have the Book of Mormon in the Bible. We're the 1830 church you try to have a conversation with him about some of the more LDS topics. He goes, none of it matters to us. We're, we're a different branch of Mormonism. And, and, and he, he, so when you talk to him, you go, wow, interesting. I have put so much of LDS into Mormonism. I forgot that it stands without the LDS church. So, but okay, that, that's a lot to say about that. Um, but yeah, but it's a book of Mormon true. <laughs> Should we just get into that? Cause yeah, let me ask you one follow up question. Then just kind of repeating back what I hear you saying is that because of your view that Joseph Smith, you know, restored these these aspects of of Mormonism, that there are so many different ways to interpret that and live up to that. That is, yes, outside of the the mainstream LDS church. But that um, leads me to a great super chat. Um, Kyle Pratt 
Thanks for the five bucks. He wrote, Quaker, do you believe all Mormon sects are valid? Do priesthood authority claims matter? If not, what's an example of a Mormon philosophy that matters? Well, like I said earlier, um, when the scriptures say, save it be, but two churches, the church of the Lamb of God versus the church of the devil. I don't believe that saying the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the 501c3 tax deductible organization is the church of the Lamb of God and everyone else is from Satan because the way Christ uses the word church is Jesus didn't have a 501c3 in the New Testament. That didn't exist. Ecclesia, called out ones, awakened ones, people who, in my opinion, are, are, are seeking that divine light. I think there is there were there is the church as in the people in an organization who follow a hierarchy who who have you know go to the same buildings and and participate in these callings but then there's the church as in people who follow the lord you know um christ says this is my church and my doctrine and he makes it very jesus makes it super super easy as to what counts as to be a member of his church i think when we're going to get to heaven um uh you know we're going to be like, wow, there's a lot more people here who disagree with me than I thought. Because it's the ego that tells us, no, no, the, a church is one 501c3 organization and those who have adherence to that 501c3 organization. Mm -hmm. That's not the biblical or scriptural definition of church. It, 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 it isn't. So what, what I hear you saying is that the way that the prophets right now that lead up the LDS church they have a incorrect interpretation that they are getting they stand in authority that so many people obey and listen to and sustain but they have an incorrect principle that they are teaching that is not uh, so exclusive to how you have to live to be counted as a follower of christ and to be in the celestial kingdom that's what i hear you saying um well in 1978 the church released a statement not a statement um an official, I guess, state, yeah, statement from the first presidency called God's love for all mankind, in which the first presidency said Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, and many Protestant leaders are inspired by God, and that those faiths are not evil, and that they have validity. I just go one step further and say, God is God over all people in most religions, and we're all finding our way back to the light. So, I'm And so the word church is we got to stop looking at churches like they're football teams. Like we have on jerseys and it's us versus like church is those who are awakened. Those who are born again, dare I say, born out of the matrix. That's what it's. It's those people who's, who've said Jesus is the way to awaken out mm -hmm. of this awful situation. But let me, let I me want to be part for of a second. That. So to answer this question, yeah, go ahead. they all matter. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the guy who commented that do all sex matter. All the Mormon sex matter. Of course. Duh, they're, they're, you'll never catch me saying, ah, well, those guys, maybe some of the Southern Utah ones who are a little bit trappy, trappy in the, you know, I'm not going to go on record and say they're doing a great job, but I think the majority of the Mormon denominations are doing a great job and they matter. And on the subject of priesthood, like oh, yeah. the, the church says that, you know, the priesthood is the way to act on behalf of God to you know, hold the keys for the administering of these ordinances that are found in the temples that are dedicated, that they spend thousands, millions and millions and millions of dollars building all over the world. Um, are you saying that people can, you know, when they become enlightened in, in coming into this Christ within this church, uh, with, a, with kind of, I don't want to repeat everything you just said, but yeah, the do you believe then that the temples and the priesthood and and the millions of dollars that go into doing these ordinances, that those are of the highest importance the way that the church, the LDS church would say that they are? That, that is a good allocation of funds. Uh, oh, don't, put, don't throw that at me. <laughs> it's, a good, uh, it's a question. Bro, I, I'm not an accountant or an economist. I'm not going to make it. I don't throw that at me. But Italy um, had a chandelier that cost six hundred thousand dollars. Yes or no? Would you sign that check and say just kidding? No, I, I, I think it's an important <laughs> question to ask because we are we are frustrated because the things you're talking about are like yes, the the ways that we love and expand our consciousness are all nice and fine and good. But going back to like the follow the prophet primary thing, I'm like where people pay their tithing, where people are actually 
uh, putting their time into these rituals and doing work for the dead when there are so many people who can be loved better and can be served better by this time and this money being spent in other places? I think it's a really important question that hits at the heart of so many Mormons, in, in my experience, who want to do good and so, serve good, but the way that they're told to do it is still um, in, in, with money and allocation that I don't agree with. But. So is, is the question, is, is your question the priesthood question or the finances one? Um, but just overall, I, let's, let's say is the, the allocation of funds for millions and millions of dollars to not only in the, in the rainy day fund or whatever they want to call it for Christ's coming, the church is obviously with the middles, widows might report has over a hundred billion dollars that the church has. And then the majority of the places that they spend it are in temples. And I would say, you know, what you just said would oppose the spending of the church putting a lot of its money into temples when sounds like you're saying all different types of Mormon sex, they have this, they, they have rights to authority and priesthood just the same. So is that a good allocation of funds if it's so universal? It's kind of like, oh, okay. I see your question. Well, yeah. okay. So you have to, uh, U-turn a little bit because, um, when we describe priesthood, uh, priesthood power, priesthood ordinances, the first question is, um, you know, why is our priesthood quote unquote better than others? But the, the, the claim of most Mormon sex, um, in regard to the priesthood is the? it's a claim that other Christian churches aren't fighting for. So when you say we have the only priesthood, we have the restored priesthood. Nobody else has that. Nobody else claims to have a priesthood given to them in modern day, you know, by, by angels coming down from heaven. It's a claim that no one else is, are, is claiming to have anyway. Um, and if we say, well, only with this priesthood can you enter the temple to perform these ordinances, that's totally fine. It's not like we're, 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 uh, we're going and saying, hey, by the way, every church wants this priesthood and these ordinances, and we're the only ones that have them. Well, no, they, other churches don't want it, and they don't really care. So, I, you know, we're, we're, we've kind of created our own terms and are, and are, and are acting um, with it. But, you know, if, if, if other Mormon sects don't deem those necessary, it doesn't mean that ours are somehow invalid because they're not validated by the other Mormon sects. Again, um, truth, especially metaphysical truth, isn't determined by how many people say they like the idea. That's, you know, that's, again, that just becomes follow the leader consciousness. Um, you know, if, if, Temples are, oh, it looks like I'm back. Um, temples are 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 great things if you believe in that that that. I guess here's here's the new age answer to that would be, um, if you believe in in manifesting, you believe in frequencies, you believe that our thoughts actually can create reality, and that there's something to aligning your thoughts in this life, with how your life is going to be in the next. And that in the vast expansiveness of of the universe and universes and cosmos and all those things, there's a way that we can actually unite um, our spirits to be with each other. And I think that's that's a phenomenal idea. I think if if the church is 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 making the claim, hey, we have no clue, you know, what's going to happen in regard to our our social unity in the next life but we do believe we can play a role in that by creating you know a a reality in which we are with those people and the temple is a way to create that reality for us that's totally chill i think that's super cool um and you don't know what you don't know so i i i don't think it's in, invalid at all um obviously people are you know doctrine and covenants is it 138 um where you've got alvin smith who's in the celestial kingdom. And this is before anything was restored. And Joseph's like, how did he make it to heaven before the gospel is restored? How'd that happen? And the Lord says, all those who died without a knowledge who would have received it will still be heirs of the celestial kingdom. So it's like, well, so you don't necessarily need it. He says, well, if you had a heart that would have received it, 
which to me suggests it's a lot more about who you are and how you love and where your consciousness is aligned and everything else you know what we do to ritualize that to manifest it in the afterlife you know i, I there's nothing wrong with that in my opinion i think it's totally fine for for the church to build those temples because that acts as an esoteric uh groundwork and framework for unity in the next life mm -hmm. all right uh i will you said a lot of things and i did listen I'm a fantastic <laughs> okay. listener. I just had to figure out what was wrong with the camera. And I did figure out it's because the room is too hot and the camera was overheating. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Well, and you know, I look better in this lighting anyway. Yeah. I look just, a little bit better. It I changes think. when the sun goes down and I'm OCD for lighting not changing, but I'm more OCD for my camera staying on. So I had to open up the door. And if you hear my kids, it's just it's what it's it okay. is. It's okay. Yeah. So I, I did listen and I, um, the only thing that, uh, I can, I, I just kind of will push back on for a second. Um, and you don't have to respond to this because I do want to get into something else, but my only piece on that for what you said that I'll push back on is, um, again, I, I just, I, I reject the, uh, aspects of the temple that I, I feel like it is one of those arguments. I don't know if somebody can help me with the, the name of the fallacy where it's something already exists and then you find reasons to, expand and say why they're good <laughs> when they're not. And I generally just believe that the temple only really came about because of like Joseph Smith's ties to polygamy and needing to have these, you know, post-dated revelations about what he's allowed to get away with and then uh, being in his Freemasonry and then having a, a cool little system with his guys, a certain secret little club of, of spiritual wifery and the, the temple, not, it's not, I, again, I don't want to like, <laughs> I want to move on to the Book of Mormon. Um, I, I don't accept, I don't think any, you know, historians honestly really accept the ideas that it's, come, the temple comes from the King, Solomon's temple or things like that. I just think it comes from Joseph Smith remixing a lot of things from his day and the temple comes out of the Freemasonry. It comes out of the spiritual wifery. Well, what's wrong with, but what's wrong with that? I'll tell you in a second. Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> and. And so now that we are 200 years later and still doing these rituals and things is to me, uh, it's, it's a relic of a past that should, like I said, with the, the analogy with Thomas Edison, that it's, it is a relic of uh, a ritual that made more sense for people of an older day dating back all the way to, you know, times in which people did blood sacrifices. And we know that that's not useful or helpful anymore. Um, and we move on and we discard things and we, we, I mean, yeah, it's, but we're we really that much different. We do blood sacrifices today. It's just called the sacrifices are for you the know, country countries. And we do it by making our blood sacrifices, people in uniform who die in other countries, same world. It's, it's we haven't changed that much. With all the technological progression, we're still the same people. There's a reason why I can FaceTime somebody in Australia right now, and we all have the ability to do that. But we still need signs in the bathroom that say "Wash your hands, please." So we haven't really changed that much. We're still kind of the same primal people we always have been. But again, from the, if you're if you're looking at uh, the restored gospel from this perspective of this, the temples, we need to find the temple ceremony written in ancient Jewish literature in, in Babylonian papyri. And it needs to be the exact same thing to prove this is legitimate. That wouldn't prove, prove it's legitimate at all. Um, even if you found tomorrow, a, a, a stone Solomon's temple ritual, here's what you got to do. And we go, wow, this is exactly like what we do today. It wouldn't make it legitimate. That just makes it more ancient. What makes the temple ceremony legitimate is found in here. If you believe, truly believe that your reality is going to be shaped by um, by these uh, ordinances and that believing that these ordinances are so will unite my spirit with my loved one in the vast expansiveness of forever, forever, one day, that is what makes it legitimate. Legitimacy of ordinances is not found in how far back you can prove it on papyri. That just means you found it a long time ago. 
what I'm suggesting and saying is that the legitimacy of what it of, of of what it's claiming to actually how it's claiming to benefit you, I'm saying that is legitimate, and that's a completely spiritual thing, one hundred percent. You um, can't prove it, but I don't want it to be proved. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of this is all kind of going around in circles about again like definitions of true and utility um yeah. versus oh it's the word like utility beliefs versus vitality beliefs i can't remember if that's the right word when you have a when things you know the the word true can be broken down for different people of does it have a utility to it or is it a, a, a valid thing because it can be proven? A validity Mormon versus a utility Mormon is kind of how it's termed. And a lot of people are members of the church because of the utility that it provides them. And some, uh, you know, they don't care a lot about uh, the things that people say, the truth claims actually flushing out and being true and to what the prophets have said that they are. And they have a, a utility to it. Or they are validity Mormons who they do take the prophets at their word. And it kind of reminds me of this old, if anyone's seen it, let me know. Quaker, tell me if you've ever seen. There's a really famous discussion slash debate between uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson from maybe like 2017, I'm going to think. And Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson are butting heads for probably three hours straight going in circles and circles and circles about how we know something is true. What does it mean for something to be true? And one of the analogies I always think is really fascinating that they bring up is they're saying like, you know, if somebody kidnaps you and puts a gun to your head and says, the only way I'm not going to kill you is if you name all of the presidents of the United States in order, and then you do that, but they are out of order. And the ways that they were wrong were actually the same way that the crazy killer also had them in their head that were wrong. But even though you were actually incorrect in listing the order of the presidents to save your life, it's a utility that it was actually true because it helps you get out of a, a bind out of the right, pinch, right, right, right? Right, right. that whole, that whole idea. And so what I hear you saying right now is, you know, the utility that it provides a person is of the most paramount value as opposed to what so many ex Mormons and people are like, but it's not the proposition of what we said was true. It's the, that that's still, that's not the list of what the presidents are, you know, it's not. And on top of that, I don't believe I can get, spirituality from that. And so my example with the temple is no, like, you know, a, most people I would say that I've talked to going through the temple, it is a, it's a huge shock. And it's like the first time they really felt like they were in a cult. And to me, I, uh, I was raised to have such a strong relationship with God. And I feel like I did. And that's why my disillusionment with the church really started in the temple because of the handshakes, because I was suddenly these rituals were not serving the type of God that I was worshiping because I could not wrap my brain around that the God that was in my soul and my spirit cared about handshakes at all. He has our attention. He has something he needs to tell us. And it's handshakes are kind of a way to get into heaven. And these are the rituals to do it, you know? And so I didn't see the validity or the utility in the temple. I mean, that's fair. <laughs> that's, that's, your, that's, you know? and I, I'm just saying, I think, um, I think that's really indicative of a, a bigger pattern within Mormonism that it's, it doesn't have the validity. It doesn't have, they're not, they're not saying things that are even remotely true or remotely serving and people put those pieces together enough and go on their own types of journeys again with the, the discarding of the filaments. But, well, I mean, again, it, if it's not your path, it's not your path, but, but the church would say that it, it should be everyone's path that like, I would argue that, you know, the, the church, is there and to the, tell and, you that and the church will say something else in 80 years line. okay again like yeah. like it's it's, eh. it's just people's people's um throughout history when they changed its doctrines plenty of times and they say doctrine doesn't change and you know church historians um like greg prince yes, and yes, all the, of the obviously the lds church has uh, again, doctrines, again right yeah that whole point um but you're still doing the, the what, go the, for it. They're still doing? doing the thing where you're saying this is Mormonism. Yeah, but my point is, um, the uh, the way that people do interact with it, um, it's it's a wholesale rejection of the proposition that has been made to us over and over again. So let's move into stuff about the Book of Mormon. Do you believe 
the Book of Mormon is historical and or are you just like a it's got the best spiritual teachings in it? You know what everything that's been said about the Book of Mormon and it's I think this is a good segue into validity yes, I, I think, versus so I, so what what I is your opinion yes, on the I think Book it of happened. Mormon? Yeah, I think it happened. I think it's historical. I think it's really it legitimately happened. That's what I think. Okay. I'm gonna ask you uh we're gonna do quick fire shots of a bunch oh, of different great. things. So All right. the first thing that comes to mind, one thing that I when I was Mormon and I I absolutely believed it was historical as well, Joseph Smith said that the hill Cumorah was behind his house. It's a clean hill. None of those battles happened there. And I think, again, historians would say that the Book of Mormon came about in a time that, yeah, you, this is what you'd expect to be in the Book of Mormon. It answers questions about why are these dark-skinned people here and uh, you know has all kinds of Protestant sermons in it. And also Joseph Smith didn't know that um, Christ wouldn't be coming in his lifetime. So I think that's a big mean feature of what Joseph Smith taught, that, that Christ was coming and it didn't really matter if things were going to be fact-checked. So um, on aspects about like where it actually took place, Joseph Smith said that the hill Kimura that's spoken about in the Book of Mormon is this hill that's, you know, over by his house. How do you square those kinds of things? Um, well, I'd like to see the quote. Because um, I can't I can't react to a quote I've never. All right. Let's say, hypothetically speaking, Joseph Smith said the hill Kimura that I'm getting these plates out of, because that's really what would make sense that these battles took place in what Rod Meldrum and Hannah Stoddard and somebody who's oh, traditionalist. Oh, I see what you're saying. They would say that you're it, saying... they're taking Joseph Smith at his words, that it that the Book of Mormon not only happened, but it happened in the places that Joseph Smith so, so, talked about. And the Hill Cumorah is the Hill Cumorah. And that, you know, when Lehi and his family parked their boat, like uh, the traditionalist view is that if Joseph Smith said that it happened here on this American continent, that it happened here. And Joseph Smith was restoring... Um, what Tim Ballard and all kinds of the people in the traditional faction call the American covenant, that the only way for the Book of Mormon I'll to even make that sense. <laughs> listen, I'm, saying, listen, I'm saying you're going down a rabbit hole. I'm I saying, do not subscribe to. Um, okay. So now so I, you're pro sex trafficking. That's what you're saying. D- no, no, hey, hey, and look, I, I defended Tim Ballard in the sense that I don't believe public excommunications by tabloid are okay. I think that was not right, but I'm also not going to judge the man to, do you want me to fix that? Kara, this is, is going to fall. And I'm it gonna, can honestly rest It's going right to fall there. on camera. And no, gonna, it'll rest. They're going to say, hey, Quaku destroyed Kara Burrell's mic. Keep talking. And, yeah. All right. I know. I don't know why it doesn't. Continue. You can talk in well. Okay. So, so um, basically, well, here's what I think. about. Um, okay. So you're not claiming that Joseph Smith made the claim that the giant, the, the ending battles of Kimura were in his backyard. You're... You're, he didn't claim that. He claimed that the plates, where he got the plates, were on the hill. That we then say this is the hill Kamor from the Book of Mormon. Because um, I'm not going to go and say I think the hill Kamor was in his back or the hill Kamor of the Book of Mormon. Um, but what I will say is you look at the Joseph interactions with the plates, sometimes the plates would disappear out of thin air. Right, like, like there was a magical quality to them. When he wasn't being as righteous, they would disappear, and he couldn't translate them. Right, right. There, there was this back and forth relationship with the plates, according to Joseph Smith's history, that makes them a lot more of like a magical talisman type of thing. Um, so, the hill Camora could have been the hill Camora, meaning the hill of of where the plates are, the record of the people. And not necessarily the battleground. I mean, we're talking about golden plates that are given to him by an angel that are disappearing at will of the angel and can only be translated. I mean, the whole thing is a magical process. Yeah, and that's. <clears throat> and I'm fine with that. But yeah. if, uh, if, 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 like, like to say, okay, well, logically, <laughs> if the Hill Camorra was, uh, if, if Hill Camorra where the plates are buried, it logically must be the same place the battle was. Well, logically, Native Americans can't come back from the dead glowing. Logically, rocks can't translate things through hats. Logically, nothing, none of this is real. But but the point is, it was all divine miracles that allowed this thing to happen. That That's the point. Mm-hmm. Um, it, to me, it, it doesn't really matter. 
Yeah. I remember when you made that quote on the tits program and I specifically remember because, um, this is my early TikTok days. Quake, you probably have no idea how many responses I made to you on TikTok back in the olden days. And it was taking that quote out. And I, um, I made a whole TikTok where I got a really cool jacket on just like you. And I did a, a whole, like, as, as if MTV was, you know, the new hip, cool, young, welcome to you know, Latter-day Zion or something I called my show and it was like, we're going to listen to Mormon apologists and stuff. And, and I played that clip because I remember you specifically saying on that, that like, we're talking about an angel and like Moroni who can travel and he's, you, you explained all of those things in that program. And my point then is, is still my point now to so many apologists who will point to things within the Bible and this, this wider context and worldview about like, well, there's also talking donkeys. And it's like, um, what, what I'm getting at is people are upset because there's just so many things that they took as not just truth that, that doesn't hold up to modern archaeology and, uh, you know, scholarship and so many things they're told is true. And then it doesn't match up with archaeology. And then their faith crisis is really not taken seriously because now the entire paradigm is what's being called into question. And so, no, it's not just like, okay, well, if you uh, believe that God can talk to donkeys and God has all these different ways of revealing his truth, just to me, it's like, well, just go along with another one, just suspend your disbelief for all these additional things. And my argument to that is like, no, the, the entire paradigm is now being called into question because a, feels like these these prophets because of the things they've said that have been so disproven over time do not uh do not deserve our respect they deserve our scrutiny and then and then too like just whether it's you know relying back on this is just what i believe or this is my testimony i don't think it's a healthy way to operate i think things should be scrutinized and not just say that like the the entire system has so much mythicalness to it we can just keep no no i'm not saying you can't question it. it because it has magical qu qualities what I'm saying, though, and that specific question um, is, does it matter if the plates, if if the hill Kimura he got the plates from is not the same hill Kimura that the battle happened? No, that doesn't really matter because the the Joseph Smith's own description of how the plates themselves operate are coming from a magical framework. If if you were to say, well. Why did uh, 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 Parley P. Pratt uh, uh, steal a man's wife? And you go, well, God flooded the world. Okay, that is not a fair answer. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying within the actual question you were asking, because I can't respond to the whole, you know, okay, so sometimes, sometimes people in the ex-Mormon world do this thing where they ask a question, but it's really just you're opening a door to a million questions of here's why I don't think it's true, which is fine to do that but i can only i can only answer one question at a time right so like i can't go in and say well the plates it's it's fine for the plates to do that and also the prophets have never said they're wrong like i'm not that 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 like you're combining all those things into one <laughs> thought well let but me I'm not let me like, before you go on let me respond uh dan vogel brings up quake is committing the fallacy of possible proof if miracles are claimed then that answers every criticism. And so it's not just me. I'm saying, well, I'm no, talking no. about the, the paradigm. Well, then he's so wrong, many, though. What? I'm not saying it answers every criticism. I'm saying I don't care about that criticism. Like me. Okay. Right. Well, I can't you... <laughs> tell you what to care about, I guess. <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. What's okay, the... so maybe uh, we can move on to another aspect. The Hill Kimura is one. It feels like to me it is a, an evidence of a thousand different things where Joseph Smith didn't know that he would be fact checked on something. And so I know you're well, pointing is, to the plates, for instance, and we can think of obviously the, the book well, of Abraham. And I know the apologetics on that one. I'm just saying from my perspective, it is, it is a systemic pattern over and over again of Joseph. Well, I will um, say not from, knowing from my recollection, fact checked. from my recollection, Joseph used the word Camorra. Um, what we know, glad tidings from Camorra. I, someone i would love for someone to send me the quote where he says the hill i went to was the hill camora of the battle in the book of mormon i haven't seen that quote if that quote exists i'm sure someone's going to comment it right now but i haven't seen it all right we'll have to see and um, so and, and 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 so if camora is then being transliterated to mean you know the, the greetings of the restored gospel which is totally fine to do how israel is a country and israel is a people if it, if it's something like that well, then suddenly we're misinterpreting mm -hmm. Joseph Smith well, to be to, to 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 ridicule him, you know, 
are you, but I would have to see the quote. That's, but I'm saying, so remember when we were talking like seven hours ago about how, like, you know, I need to see the quote and I'm like, but so much it doesn't even matter if the quote is there or not we can see by the entire pattern of the policies and the way that something was lived out so like do you not believe that joseph smith believed that the like lamanites were the native americans and that the book of mormon took place well america in... america's half the world <laughs> america's massive but no We're... in the places that these frontier communities were settling in in you know Ohio and oh, and uh, Pennsylvania and Vermont and New York, like Joseph Smith believed that that's where the Book of Mormon took place. You know, do you not believe that that's what he believed? Or because I'm saying it doesn't even need well, to be that, a quote it, about Hilkamura. I'm like that's what he believed. He sent missionaries to go convert the Lamanites. He said these. He went over to like the, the Zelf. You remember like the thing with the yeah, bone? Yeah. He's like these yeah. are Book of Mormon battles took place here. It does. It, it doesn't really matter. I mean, like if. I don't know. I'm not going to go make a statement statement where I think the Book of Mormon took place. I have my own theory, but I'm not going to say it um, because I don't want to get into that world. Uh, But there is no Book of Joseph in the Book of Mormon. The scriptures Joseph Smith gave us are of ancient people or he's channeling the Lord. His opinion on some of those things kind of may be as good as anybody else's. Why do why, why does the Book of Mormon, which purports to be an ancient text not written by Joseph Smith, why do I have to believe um, or, or why do I have to affirm a hypothesis of where he thinks it took place? Unless he's saying, thus saith the Lord told me Zarahemla was in Cedar Rapids. Like, OK, that doesn't exist. How, you know, just be. Just because a mystic has an opinion about the information of this channel that didn't even come from him doesn't mean I now must agree with every opinion of that mystic. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think that at all. If, if he was saying this Book of Mormon came, f- everything took place between the Mississippi River and wherever, and this is what Jesus Christ told me, and this area right here is a promised land, we go, oh, well... Interesting idea. We're, we're going to have to dissect that because that starts to, 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 to make us question. But if it isn't that, and he's just saying, I believe this is where this happened. Well, that's totally fine. Because again, we can separate um, the divine information being given to someone from that person's later perspective. Joe Smith barely even used the Book of Mormon in his sermons, which is interesting. He rarely even quoted it. He mostly quoted the Old Testament. Right. So Joseph Smith gave us the Book of Mormon and in, 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 in contrast to all of his sermons and lectures, he barely even touched it in his actual preaching. You know, um, uh, I, I, I liken it to Helen Shookman with The Course of Miracles. She channels that whole book and doesn't even want to copyright it, doesn't want to make money from it, doesn't want anything to do with it. You know, um, if Helen Shookman has something wrong with her in her her her, she puts an idea forward in one of her essays as a psychology professor and it 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 contradicts the course of miracles i'm not going to go well the whole thing is fake i'm gonna go okay she was the vessel but the vessel does not have to be 100 percent right as long as the product and the implications of the product are something that's really worth examining so that's why i think we in the same way we have to disconnect the lds church um from mormonism we have to also disconnect Joseph Smith from the Book of Mormon, because if he if if it is what he's claiming it to be, we have to detach him because if he's claiming I didn't write this, this came from someone else. We can't just view it only through his eyes because he's not the author. Mm-hmm. OK, so let's get into more of the validity of the Book of Mormon and, and I guess what is in it. The argument uh, goes, obviously, that. There is a lot of 19th century material in the Book of Mormon. Richard Bushman and various church historians uh, will say that, yeah, it's it's obviously got a lot of things from Joseph Smith's day and, and his milieu that have been remixed and put into this text. Various things from the Joseph or the King James version of the Bible that still have um, things that have been mistranslated from the King James Bible that are put into the Book of Mormon. And so with the various different ways that we've been taught, I would say, um, you can disagree with this, of 
uh, things being taught one way throughout church history about how Joseph Smith revealed the or translated the Book of Mormon by running his fingers over the golden plates and then, you know, dictating what that would be in from reformed Egyptian into English for his scribes to write down. And then obviously the, the more uh, modern take of what we're understanding now about what the actual people in the room have been saying about the rock in the hat and those revelations and, and the argument between a loose translation of the book of Mormon and Joseph Smith being able to take ideas that he had um, and put it into the text of the Book of Mormon versus a tight translation of exactly what was either revealed on the plates or on the stone. So where do you come down on how um, loose versus tight translation and how we have, um, yes, so many things that would make Richard Bushman and others say that this has 19th century material in it? Who cares what they think? <laughs> like, do like, you think that it has 19th century material in it? Or do you think that it is, yes, ancient, since you say like, yes, these things actually took place? Um, that there's that's it's written by ancient prophets and it is the words of them put into the book that we have today. Uh, but I think both can be true. I think it's ancient, but I do think when you're translating it for the the purposes of raising someone's high, to a higher spirituality, you can liken certain things to be in a way we can understand it. I think it's totally fine. I think God would probably do that. That seems something he would definitely want to do. You know, I mean, it, uh, uh, it, it, it. I don't, I don't see why not. I don't see why the parameters of, of channeling new, of ch of channeling spiritual records that are stored in heaven, have to be. You know, they they can't ha they can't have a flare that helps us understand it to our own perspective. I don't I don't see why those rules would exist. Mm, yeah, I I know a lot of your opinions on this, so I'll kind of um since we're approaching three hours, we can start to kind of wrap up. Um, but I'm just trying to think off the top of my head other, cause I, I know a lot of your opinions around, um, yeah, the book of Mormon and, uh, one of my favorite videos I've ever made was responding to word radio when you guys had Hannah Stoddard on. And so what I found was so interesting is cause I think you were pushing back quite a bit on the traditionalist view that she, Rod Meldrum, again, this traditionalist faction that's still mainstream LDS, that have on the Book of Mormon, they would say that Joseph Smith did not use a rock and a hat. Absolutely not. That is a satanic device. And Hannah Stoddard said in that interview you did with her about how, like, Joseph Smith, there's no way he is a prophet if he used those things. Those are, you know, mechanisms of the occult. And um, I feel like you pushed back quite a bit on that. And, um, but the interesting thing is, I the Ward Radio comment section was like, can't wait to have Hannah Stoddard back on. Um, and it was, I feel like the comment section was 99% of the word radio viewers um, really rejecting anything to do with um, yeah, rock and a hat, which is now what is in the gospel topics essays and, and what the church tells people is the method of translation. So where do you come down on that? Is Was a rock and a hat used? I know you're like, it doesn't matter if I care, but do you believe that that was the method? And how do you respond to people in the traditionalist faction who would say that it's satanic? Oh, okay. Well, okay. First, I want to say just for the record, um, uh, I don't know Hannah that well. I've only talked with her through there, through the through the show. Um, I I know. I Ro know everything she believes. Okay. <laughs> I honestly have a track inside her mind. I've read everything she's ever done and watched wow. everything. I love. I love the <laughs> okay. traditionalist faction. I wish I could talk about it constantly. So, oh, okay. Continue. okay. Well, I uh, could probably answer a question if you had a question about her. But well, anyway, I know. I know Rod personally. I love Rod Meldrum. I think he's a phenomenal guy really really kind christ-like person so i like all these people i really do um i think yeah he 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 used the, the divining stone for sure um and um you know i think if you if you i'm gonna use this word people get mad but whatever a lot of psychics and people involved in sort of that metaphysical energy dimensional that whole work oftentimes will have a certain object they use to that like opens a key for the channeling you know um so yeah i think i think it's totally fine but but this also and i don't want to get into this a whole other tangent but i have a thing i'm going to be presenting on pretty soon about um how you know if you're if you're if you're approaching the translation perspective from there is no god well then yeah it's it's it's, it's nonsense but if you're approaching from the perspective of you know 
there is a God and God is in charge of this world. God has God is in charge of of, of the light spectrum. Then that kind of changes changes everything. I mean, human beings, right? We can only see zero point zero zero five percent of act- what's actually in front of us on the on the on the light spectrum. That's that zero point zero zero five percent of visible light is all we can see. We can't even see one percent of what's actually here. And if this spectrum of light is actually um, uh, being controlled by God or the gods, then it, it it's pretty easy that they could uh, transfigure someone to see two or three percent to be able to do perform these kinds of miracles, right? So I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with there being a seer stone or a divining stone, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think there's a lot more magic to this world. We now live in a time which we know that there are frequencies, that thoughts create frequencies and thoughts create realities. We know that we live in a magical world. And um, and that pure, you know, um, materialist, atheistic perspective that people want to view the book of translation of the Book of Mormon through, well, you're not going to, of course, you're going to come to the conclusion that, it, that, it, that it's bunk. But if you accept that we do have a world of miracles and some of these things we can't explain are <laughs> I'm just listening to your kids think uh, yeah, you can close the door probably so. um, you know I, I think it's totally fine I think it it's actually makes sense I think on the, the idea of God operating changing the visible light spectrum completely makes the idea of the seer stones make a lot of sense and and God, Joseph Smith used these objects as a way to ignite that that uh that that divine translation to to ignite that divine connection that would allow him to tap into the all mind where we get the book of mormon from all right here's my snarky ex-mormon reply um as my friend i can't find oh chris murphy asked this is our snarky ex-mormon reply to that then why did god make joseph um why didn't god just make Joseph able to read the plates. And then he also had another comment. Sorry, that wasn't the one I exactly wanted to show, but it was basically about, yeah, here's my snarky X one reply to that Kwaku is, um, yeah, I get you except for what is like errors from the King James Bible doing in the book of Mormon. Um, I know you don't make me go into apologist mode. Don't I, do it. But the thing is <sighs> okay. just one sentence answer, because I understand what you're saying, but when we're, when push comes to shove, I do. They're not errors. When I read <laughs> that one book, that one PDF, when I read it and he said it was errors and I said, where are the errors? And it just linked back to a chart he made where he said they were errors. I, oh, let's that doesn't count as way. an error. Let's put it That's way. not just making an Let error. Put it this way. Let's put it this way. What about how, for instance, in the Book of Mormon it is said that it comes from the blast brass plates that are taken. And we know that like Deutero Isaiah, that what we have in the King James Bible wasn't even written until long after Lehi left Jerusalem and would not have access to those writings that the writings that are in the book of Mormon. Wait, wait, okay. are the, I, I know exactly what you're saying. Yeah, I know so exactly what, where you're going. Give me your apologetics on Deutero Isaiah. Why are things in the book of Mormon that were supposed to be written at this time period on the, from these plates that were not, you're going to hate my answer. You're going to hate much longer. You're going to hate my answer. And remember the whole reason I'm asking this is because we're talking about what you just said about such an expansive view, but I'm like, when yeah. push comes to shove, why you're are these things in there? Absolutely detest my answer. Do it. Um, that argument is 100% relying upon scholars and archaeologists who already admit they don't know things until they can find a source of them. In the same way we didn't know about the Guatemala lowlands, the Maya lowlands in ancient Guatemala, we didn't know there was a city the size of Chicago underground until 30, 40 years ago. It's the same argument. It's the, well, we haven't found this yet. We 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 haven't found evidence of 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 of, um, of of these Isaiah writings, you know, that that Lehi would have had access to. That means it's fake. It's like how many times are we going to rely upon nameless scholars that are telling us a version of world history that we already disagree with fifty percent of them on anyway? Like, I literally do not get 
why I can look at the things the Book of Mormon gets right and the miracles it brings forth and the implications of how it could absolutely revolutionize society and change our spirits and throw it away because, well, the Deutero-Isaiah controversy. Like, who cares okay. what these guys I haven't do hate found it. You're it. right. Okay. <laughs> they haven't, like, no, but, but. Here, like, all right, continue. There are no lions. Well, well, there couldn't have been lions in Israel because, okay, until we found the lion bones. Like, literally, why do we put so much stake into what these guys, what they haven't found yet? Like, I'm supposed to revolutionize my whole spiritual connection and belief in this book because of some nameless scholars who haven't found the thing yet. Like, who cares? Here. All like, right. why am I supposed to? Don't follow the prophet. Don't follow. That's follow the leader of consciousness until there's a PhD next to the name. And then it's bow down to them. Like, it blows my mind because I would think ex-Mormons. Well, I guess not all ex-Mormons. Ex-Mormons in the space would just be as critical, as critical as anyone claiming to have authority on a subject and especially a subject as mysterious as world history and archaeology we can't prove most things like we have no clue why plato went for freaking 50 pages long of dialogues on lost cities and civilizations we can't prove but referencing them as if they were real as if they're historical realities do we just go ah nonsense no we freaking study plato and we say let's let's look at this and let's give it more than 200 years you know then you just say oh it's it's a bunch of it's 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 nonsense i just uh, i don't get it i right. don't get it all right we're gonna wrap up and okay. i want some quick yes or no it's is because oh. i'm the nuance ho. people don't know that's your true. fan base true. i think hates me they call me the unnuanced whore which i think is funny because i'm like i already gave you guys the joke the joke is i call myself yeah nuanced it's a ho. rehash you can't yeah. i already did the thing it's like anyway um but I think I'm actually quite nuanced today. I understand your perspectives. If and they called you small-minded virgin, then that would be funny. Okay, because it's like the opposite of mm -hmm. nuance. So yeah, they're just taking your joke and they're making a bad version. That's Thank true. Thank you. But they did yeah. call me Dobby the house elf. And I'm like, no notes. Perfect. I know what I look like. And I'm like, fair assessment. That's fine. So I think, I think uh there's so many things throughout this conversation that, you know, my audience is going to say you should have pushed back on these things, but I enjoy hearing your perspectives and talking and stuff, but I want to get really unnuanced both of us and kind of do a quick, um, like yes or no on a couple different things. And if we can keep it kind of short. So, uh, I forgot what I was going to ask you though. The thing you just said, repeat it again. Sorry. You were saying about the K the King James. Oh yeah. The Bible. That's what I was going to ask. So, okay. So here's my problem. The problem with so much about a Mormon apologetics from my perspective is that it, yes, only wants to look at a certain key. And if we can just find one hole to poke in this of a, a, a room for possibility and just say, well, think about this. Could it be possible that this opens it up? And then that gives people enough room to, you know, maintain their faith here, here, here. But the problem to me is that so often Mormon apologists, they don't want to look at the entire picture of everything together. And when I was first deconstructing Mormonism, I could look at this piece. I totally could. I could understand. I read all of the fair Mormon arguments for and against. I went back and forth and back and forth. And I was able to say like, okay, this piece alone, I can understand why God would do this and this piece alone, but there's just too much overwhelming, too many pieces put together. And so what the problem is, is kind of what I heard you say is to me, um, again, I, I don't want to be like highly disagreeable just for the sake of being disagreeable. It really just is an argument from, okay, well, God can, can it, God, he can do all these different type of mystical things and we don't know everything. So that just suspend your disbelief and you know, the things are, are yet to be revealed and, and yet to be known and so forth. But looking at everything in its entire picture to me, though, has an entire pattern of a fraud. And it's it's the Book of Mormon itself. The revelations stop with things that are only really known to what Joseph Smith had known up to that point in world history about things like uh, previous, you know, what he's calling um, revelations from the the ancient prophet's point of view are things that um, like Columbus and that hadn't happened yet, but he's not, he's not doing anything that's actively uh, proving that he's, he's got a lot to say about like the civil war that's right around the corner. You know, you know what I mean? Um, I, I feel like it's, it's, well, it's not about the things that we don't know right now. It's okay. an obvious well, looking at what Joseph Smith said and knowing that it is a fraud because of a thousand different angles 
and not just like, well, we can't trust these scholars because they haven't exactly revealed this exact thing. We know a lot of stuff over here, a lot, a lot of stuff. And Joseph Smith just did not reveal a lot of things that were outside of what you would expect him to reveal. Okay. That's okay. my argument. Okay. I see. Well, I can only respond to the specifics because, and the first thing I'll say is I think it is, um, you got to be a little, you got to be a little bit hesitant to accept when any, whenever anyone says they've looked at everything in regard to a religion, like you can't, it would take a lifetime to be able to say you looked at everything in Mormonism. Like it's, it's not possible, you know, no one's no, we're not supercomputers. Um, but the examples you just gave for one, um, you know, uh, the book of Mormon is a fraud and it has things that someone in the 19th century would write into it. You gave the example of Columbus. The Book of Mormon doesn't mention Columbus. We we attributed um, the Gentile upon the waters to be Columbus, but we don't know if that's Christopher Columbus. We just decided it was. We have no clue, right? Um, and it could be a lot of people, probably not someone who was a parader of armies during the Great Apostasy, which is what the Book of Mormon claims to want to fix. So it doesn't really make sense for it to be Columbus in my in my view. But again, that's not a Joseph Smith thing. That's a thing later on that we're saying he taught and he didn't teach. Um, um, yeah, the Book of Mormon isn't going to predict the Civil War because it's an ancient book, but he did predict the Civil War in the Doctrine and Covenants. You know, 30 years before the Civil War, it's right there. Southern states will be divided against the northern states, starting with the rebellion in South Carolina in Doctrine and Covenants 87. And you can go to the Joe Smith papers and you can see the original writing from 18... Um, uh boy 33 36 where it's straight up the civil war prophecy by joseph smith and it's exactly right so i mean he was doing things a prophet would do um but even if they're book of mormon you know to to, to to answer that it's there are things in the book of mormon that people in the 19th century wouldn't want to wouldn't assume like the, the 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 strange ancient technology of the brother of Jared is something way forward thinking that no one in the 19th century was coming up with. Um, um, the 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 uh, the 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 criticizing of 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 well showing the the downfall of 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 nationalism and patriotism as outlined by the aftermath of the war chapters, not also not a popular 19th century view. Um, uh, we we read the war chapters in the Book of Mormon and think uh, think it as rabble rousing patriotism, but I think when you really read it, and people like Hugh Nibley would agree, the point of the war chapters is to prove that the wars don't work, and 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 that you know um, pure blood patriotism and nationalism don't actually lead to the safety of your people in the long run, right? That's not a popular 19th century view to have. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you're reading in the worst possible, you know, interpretation of it, then I see your point. But I, I I think again that's doing a disservice to to Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. um, so some people are are pushing back quite a bit about everything that you said, and I will I let people <laughs> in the comment section do that. Um, I think overall, um, yeah, I think things that you said there, there's a lot of nuance and uh, things that are are not quite accurate. But we'll save that for the comment section. Um, the the thing I, I was mostly trying to to get at is the everything looking looking at the entire whole of of joseph smith um you see him it sounds like yes is more of a revolutionary for his time as one of the most amazing, amazing people in american history like top okay. 10 okay and um i would say you know he he did his thing and <laughs> he had some ideas and um i think his his popularity was uh was yeah uh um an outgrowth of yes a lot of his creativity is you know the old saying kind of goes that joseph smith was more of like the creative guy when you start a business you need the creative and then you need like the iron fist and brigham young was the the iron fist going forward and so my opinion is you know no matter how uh creative or inspired joseph smith was um the book of Borman in and of itself to me, yes, has so many things within it that only make sense to uh, Joseph Smith's milieu and the worldview of, you know, 1830. And can I ask them what those are? Because so far of the, the, the examples you've given, I haven't 
seen the. You All know, right, I'll keep going. Yeah. So um, the. Yeah, I guess the the Jaredite submarines and boats and the ways that those are described. I got a big problem with the the I don't know. Uh, but, fantasy, but that's definitely not like, a 19th century, you know, idea of of ancient. You know, this is like. Let me finish. Yeah, the the. I did an entire episode on the Tower of Babel with John Larson on Mormon stories a while ago. And so much of the Book of Mormon, though, it does come from this literal idea that there was a Tower of Babel, that there was languages that were confounded and that they got on a ship and were able to seal it up. So it was tight like onto a dish so that it could go underneath the water. Um, to me, yeah, the the worldview of Joseph Smith saying that there um, uh, was a literal Tower of Babel or... Yeah, I could keep going, but what are your thoughts on that one? I do believe there's a literal, literal Tower of Babel. We did a whole episode on it, and I went even crazier, Bill, on that, on 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 Nimrod and Queen Samaramis, and you know, so yeah, I, I, I yeah, I think for sure. Okay. I mean, I'm also the kind of guy that really likes Graham Hancock, so you can kind of take that mm -hmm. for as, as you will, you know. Mm -hmm. So. Um, basically, to summarize, we agree on nothing. And everyone <laughs> was saying true. I've been very sweet today, but um, I was interested in. We do agree on Israel Palestine. It's a shame we haven't we didn't get time, but yeah. Um, overall, anything, any words that you want to say about? Let's let me just say one last yeah thing on that because um, I did a four part series on Israel Palestine. I know that you have talked about it a lot as well, and um, people yeah when you bring on diverse opinions sometimes people are like don't platform that person i got no problem making sure that we everybody from every different spectrum has you know can have an opinion and and i think that we've gotten along just fine um but it is important to me whenever i have a platform to speak about things that are like you know what actually matters and what i think people ideas that people should wrestle with and think about and it's interesting that you from the, the sphere that you're in, so much of this started again, like I said at the beginning, about you feeling like you have been uh, cornered as being way more conservative than you actually are. And, and I know that you've had a lot of discussions with people on board radio, other co-hosts, other people in this, um, on the, the more Mormon apologetic side of things, debating about Israel-Palestine. And um, it's important to me that Mormons and ex-Mormons at least really consider the what I would say is like Zionism that's really baked into the religion um, about, you know, I had a patriarchal blessing and I was told that I'm from the tribe of Ephraim. And th these ideas that are um, baked into Mormonism that sometimes we we don't always deconstruct as we leave the church and uh, still kind of follow exactly what we were told to follow and prescribed. Um, I can get into another video another time. And you can watch my other four videos about the history that I do with Lindsay. Um, I find it socially awkward about the history of why Mormonism is so tied to Zionism and why um, everything about the war and the conflict that's been going on right now is deeply tied to Mormon theology. And it's it's insane. It's really important stuff to talk about. So on that last subject, I just thought, yeah, if there's anything that um, you, you want to add, what? I think my camera might have gone out. Again? I, I heard it do like a little like thing. I can't wait. To not have that's probably now. There we go. Um, so what from if you want to just wrap up with you know, a little bit about what do you feel like is the pushback? Um, what are the opinions that you hear from the more like well, we have BYU side Jerusalem, is, you know, yeah. we have BYU Jerusalem, we have you know, um, because of patriarchal blessings, everyone gets a tribe of Israel declared, and because of that, and 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 Utah it, as the breeding ground of of. Church of Christ Latter Day Saints is very Republican, very pro, you know, Israel in, in regard to Zionism, and that's made people just support Zionism in this in this conflict. But I I I, I don't think you. It's pretty clear what we're witnessing is a genocide before our eyes. I mean, hundred percent agree. How many? Do when Doctors Without Borders come, they come out and say, no, this is a genocide. They are purposefully disallowing the, the food we're dropping into Palestine. They, they are targeting children. Every argument you heard right after Oxo October 7th, how funny how they've all been discarded. The, the, ch the children as human shields discarded argument. The, all that stuff is getting <clears throat> discarded. It's so clear we are witnessing a genocide. You don't kill 15,000 children and walk away scot-free. Um, 
and it is unfortunate that so many members of the church um, have this, they've conflated ancient Israel with the modern state of Israel, which even more so the Zionist approach to the modern state of Israel, that is not what the scriptures tell us to support. Israel becomes a people, it's a state of mind, it's a heart. It is not a, a government led by Netanyahu, a already convicted uh, a criminal and mass murderer. It's just not. And the fact that people are walking on eggshells to decry the, 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 the abject murder of thousands of people, when it, 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 it's mind-numbing to me. It's crazy that people are so quick to defend this. Like, we are witnessing a genocide. Hundred percent. I don't know how you can look at the situation and and think that. I don't know. I just it it almost makes me emotional. So I'm like I. It just... I thought that would be a good thing to end on because um I agree completely. I went to the the march that was in Salt Lake a while ago, and we can I could argue this like I did in four different videos that I've done um because I think no matter what you and I might disagree on um there's certain universal things of yeah what's going on in the world right now just to raise a voice to it and it yeah. should make people emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, it does, it does. It's just, it, people don't deserve to be pawns in warlords and politicians games. Human lives are not pawns for property expansion. And the fact that we are, we're, we are not honoring the lives of the people in, in Gaza and now Lebanon you know, the fact that we're not honoring them and we're viewing them just as collateral damage to me is just it's so how can you even call yourself a Christian if you have that approach? Like, like legitimately, how can you call yourself a Christian and say you believe that all people are children of God when you are viewing 15,000 young, beautiful Arab children as collateral damage because you believe in the expansion of the Zionist state? Mind boggling mind-boggling i know i'm gonna get canceled for saying it i already know mm -hmm. i already know mm -hmm. i don't care i don't care what's that quote from the charlie Hebdo guy i'd rather um die standing than live on my knees that's how i feel about this subject mm -hmm. yeah and i can already see people from my comment section you know disagreeing with you and if you disagree with quaco on that you're disagreeing <laughs> with me and that's fine um because i just feel like yeah the 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 arguments that were levied against people after the you know from October 7th and onward um, still really haven't held up right now. No. That it's just an argument about Hamas this and Hamas that. And, and, and it's just, yeah. it hasn't held up then. And it doesn't hold up now, especially when you look at the entire conflict in the course of 75 years um, when there's what 30,000 innocent civilians. It didn't begin October out, 7th. So. It didn't begin October 7th. Yeah. All right. Oh, well. So we can agree on one thing and one thing only, but the um, most important thing of, of the subject we've talked about, you know, yeah. and because at the end of the day, um, religions and just dogmatic beliefs uh, that people have in their heads are something that I believe should always at least be questioned. And I do appreciate your willingness to come on and show how you've questioned things, even if I, I disagree with the ways and things um, that you've gotten to and um, I, I overall, I, I respect you for at least coming in here and, and explaining yourself that it shows that you've thought a lot about something that people don't think a lot about, which I can't, I don't know if you disagree with that. I just don't think most people who hold uh, such religious beliefs to an institution like Mormonism or Judaism or, you know, Islam, um, sometimes they just don't have the time and effort and space to expand upon and, and figure out um, how to do the best within that system and, and and carve their own little space in there. So I do understand and I do respect where you're coming from on a lot of that stuff, even if I disagree with your exact you know, right. apologetics on certain things. I'm so. happy I was here. I'm thankful that you let me come on and uh and you're not mean. Every people are saying that you're mean. You're not mean. I'm literally the nicest. So you know I don't want to toot my own horn here, but <laughs> I literally gave a speech for an hour the other day on please, I just Everything okay, my name's, love. my name's Gary and I have a secret boyfriend. So, you know, I mean, it's uh, it, we're all we're all mysterious and misunderstood. Again, so. from the reference from the very beginning, I have. Missionaries yeah, to yeah. If you, if you didn't watch here. the beginning, then that sounds really weird. But that was. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't. I, my name is not Gary, nor I am straight. I just. <laughs> well, is there anything that you want to plug? No, no, I'm just uh, I'm happy I was here to talk about this stuff. And, you know, uh, yeah, really, I, I have nothing to plug. Um. But this is this is cool. It's a great a set. Time. It does smell good. 
And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. mean. No, no. You've got my number. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of reaction and feedback from people. But uh, I have of everything I have done in a while. The amount of people who have DM'd me, messaged me, <laughs> texting me right now. The amount of like my friends, X Marmon Space, who are saying like screaming their head off at certain things that you've said. I'm like, <laughs> literally, I want Quaker's audience, anyone in, in the Mormon world to realize I'm like, I am nowhere near as like, you know, ready to rip anyone's head off. I just want right. to hear what people's opinions are, how they arrived at them and just kind of go, huh, all right, well, this is my opinion. You're not, all right, we'll move on to the next thing. Um, doesn't really serve me very well if I don't kind of operate from a place of everybody is on their journey. I'm on a journey, you know, yeah. and I, I hope that we all can at least operate from a place of listening first to, to understand where somebody is coming from instead of yeah. jumping down their throat of like, I think you believe this and, and or, your, your, or your intentions are this and they're negative, right? Misinterpreting what they say and reacting to the, the fake version of, of of what they said as opposed to what they're actually saying right yeah building up a strong a straw man um i really do try to steal man people's uh, opinions and I've, I've done a lot of reactions to things you've said and stuff over the years and um i hope that this was a, a beneficial discussion for the people who stuck around for the three hours to hang out with me and Kwaku with this so thank you guys so much i do put a lot of work into you know running this youtube channel i have a 501c3 nonprofit now called the nuance hug foundation um all donations to my donor box are tax deductible in the united states and that helps a lot to uh keep continuing this youtube channel and if you like what i do you can um obviously subscribe head over to my patreon.com slash nuance um, where everything is ad free and we have another fun community over there. And you guys know that um, these kind of discussions will, will continue. And I, I invite anybody else on who uh, is in the Mormon sphere who might be watching this and say, um, I'd also like to go in and debate Kara. You're welcome to email me. That's down below. So love to hear all your comments, anything that you guys have to say in reaction to this. Thank you again, Kwaku for sticking it out and actually making this happen. Didn't know if it would really happen, but you did it. You're a man of your word. You got in here. So thank yes. you again for that. And um, see you guys next time on another episode of the Mormon History Hoedown. Appreciate you guys. Love you so much, everybody.